You're watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, Wednesday night, 11 p.m., September 13th, 2023. Today we are playing the latest box from the Deadbolt Mystery Society called the Blue Moon Boogeyman. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're playing this, the sort of ground rules for playing this. We'll do a little bookkeeping and then we'll jump into it. Let me just check in with the chat, make sure everything's connected. Everyone's here. I see YouTube says 13 viewers and two likes. If you do want to see more of this kind of content on the channel, I do hope you'll give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. It makes it more enjoyable for me and it helps me see what games people like what games people would prefer to see. Okay, so let's talk about why we're playing this particular box, since the channel has already chimed in complaining that we're not playing a different box. I have, at this point, acquired almost every box from Deadbolt Mystery Society going back six or so years. There are several dozen. Um... And I'm on record saying that at their current price, that when it when they have a new box come out, it's a subscription service, but you can buy one-off boxes occasionally. And the boxes typically sell when they're released for upwards of $30. To me, that's too expensive to purchase them at that price. And then you add shipping and I purchase all the games we play on this channel. I have no relationship to any publishers. Um, but they do occasionally run sales, and they had a big sale, 50% off the subscription. And when they did, I signed up for a subscription. That means I get the new boxes when they come out, in addition to the backlog catalog that I have. So my strategy for that is that we should play the new boxes right when they arrive. And this just arrived a couple days ago, so that's why we're playing this. Then we'll go back to playing the older games. And Tina says, I don't think we were complaining, but someone really wants to play the Blackout box. I am thankful for every game. Uh, I'm just teasing. When I complain about the channel or say that people are complaining or not giving me the credit, it's all teasing in good fun. 
Okay, so, but because we are playing this new box, the latest box, what you should know, there are a couple of ground rules for that. First of all, as with all of the mystery games we play on this channel, you can really only play through them once. So if you think this might be a game that you would be interested in playing with your group or solo, then you shouldn't watch the whole playthrough. Maybe you watch the introduction, you say, okay, this looks interesting, I'll buy it, I'll get it for myself. You can typically find these on eBay for like 20, 25 bucks. If you do happen to have this box at home and you just got it because you're also a subscriber, the ground rules for playing along with us are simple. You shouldn't go ahead of us and then post your solution in the channel. The goal of the channel is not to come up with the solution as fast as possible, it's to enjoy it. We've already got some ringers in the channel, some people who are really good at puzzles, much better than I am, who solve these very quickly. And in fact, frequently lately, I've had to look away from the chat to give myself a chance to digest the puzzles before someone else solves them. So you know that if, and you could pause this, work on it yourself and pause it until you get it solved. You don't have to watch the stream. And if you're in the chat and you do figure out the solution while we're playing it, no jumping ahead, then feel free to post that you've come up with a solution, but don't be upset if I don't look at it right away. Okay, so we'll be playing this tonight. Now, a couple other bookkeeping items. On Sunday, in four days, normally I like to play these games, especially the long ones, at night, 11 p.m. That's what it is here in the Midwest. But we have a Sunday daytime afternoon stream that we've been playing play-by-mail games for many months. And uh, we're still waiting for the next set of letters from Dear Holmes. Last Sunday, we had the solution and wrap-up. It was interesting. We talked about it. This Sunday, we're going to do something a little different. This Sunday, we're finally going to play the first case, at least the first case, from a game called Mugbook, one of the most rare out-of-print games that I own. This was a city detective game inspired, clearly or inspired Gumshoe, inspired by Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, clearly some relation to Gumshoe, a game that I've played and talked about on the channel. Uh, there are no other playthroughs of it on YouTube. I'm not sure there are even any reviews on Board Game Geek. It's a very rare game. I did a long deep dive into it video that you can watch in preparation for our playthrough. On Sunday, we're going to try to play the first case. I'm going to have to refresh my memory of how to play it. And one of the viewers on the channel, Rob, has prepared some print and play versions or reformatted versions of some of the evidence and documents that we will provide a link to. I'll add it to the video soon so that you could download and play along with us if you want to play. I'm very much looking forward to it from a game design perspective to see what it does differently. It tries some new stuff. It's thin on narrative, but it has lots of little paragraphs. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a different experience. It'll be a retro throwback to 80s. I don't know how good it's going to be, but it will be interesting. And that's a great segue to the other thing I want to keep reminding you, which is that at the end of this month, I'll have my first game development live stream where I'm going to be talking about High and Low, the New York City film noir detective game that I've been working on for several months now. A bunch of people in the channel helping me with it. And I need all the help I can get. And so that'll probably be in the last week of this month. And then every month after that, I'll do at least one live stream talking about the updates on the progress on that game, showing some stuff, talking about some of the issues I'm struggling with, but also talking about other mystery games, what can be learned from them, uh, how to hide clues, all everything related to some of the lessons we've talked about when we review these games 
and uh, talking about how we can incorporate and borrow as much of the good and avoid the bad. I'm looking forward to those. And I hope if you have an interest in these games, what makes them work, you'll join me and help me figure out some of these issues as I move forward and talk about the development of High and Low, and I'll give you updates on the progress of that game. Anything else to talk about? Yes, a couple more things. In October, next month, we'll be streaming a lot, and we'll be playing lots of horror creepy games. Uh, a lot, couple people on this channel, Jonathan Warner in particular, and I have gotten into the habit of playing special long games over holidays, and Halloween is one of those times. So I have ordered a couple of deluxe, scary, creepy games for us. One called The Root of All Evil, which just arrived in a wooden crate. Looks like it's going to be a creepy experience. So we'll try to focus on some scary, creepy games during Halloween and some especially long ones. We'll probably play Deadbolt Mystery Society either. There's a series of four, Copycat, and uh, another series of two, Catch Me If You Can. We'll pick one of those to play. And we're going to play Mythos Tales and Bureau of Investigation fan cases. Some stuff I'm really looking forward to. If you want to make sure that we our schedule is compatible with yours, if there's a game that in particular you're interested in joining for, or you want to help decide what games to play, you should go to the Board Game Geek Guild for this channel. There's a link on the About page of the YouTube channel. There's a thread called GameQ, and now there's another thread called October Halloween Games, whatever. So stop by and let me know what games you're particularly interested in playing. You can express your interest in general, but especially for Halloween. Last little thing, uh, tomorrow I'm heading over to Greg's to record a top 10 revenge movies. Greg has a movie channel, mostly doing top 10s. We recorded a top 10 mystery movies recently that you should check out if you haven't, and keep your eye open for top 10 revenge movies. I think there'll be some overlap, but I've got a couple, I've got a couple of interesting ones for you. Um, there's a link to that also on the about page. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Anything else from the chat? And Tina says. Well, I'm not going to say what Antina says. You'll have to watch and find out. You'll have to watch and find out. Okay. Shall we get started here with Blue Moon Boogeyman? Nothing else on the chat. Any other projects anyone's working on the chat? You should, Greg doesn't uh, comment on videos, but you should go and comment on his videos, on his movie reviews, and make your own suggestions. Let's see, anything else on the chat? Or shall we just start? Anyone up to any interesting projects? I can't, you can't wait for me to ask that. You should know that every video I'm interested, if you're working on projects, hobbies, movies you've seen, games you've played, but you can't wait for me to ask it because of the YouTube delays. It takes too long. I have, I noticed behind me Vienna Connection. Vienna Connection was the Cold War spy game built on Detective Modern Crime board game. If I had known that was going to be the only one of that series we were ever going to get, I think I would have favored it a little more. I really miss I miss it. I wish there were more, but I did get a box of four or five spy themed puzzle games like Deadbolt Mystery Society called Breakout by Dispatch. I did pick up a bunch of those, so we'll have to figure out how to schedule those in, but that may have to wait till October. Okay, let's just go ahead and open up Blue Moon Boogeyman and get started here. So one of the things I discovered when I started subscribing to Deadbolt Mystery Society instead of buying them used is when you get the subscriber boxes, you get this little newsletter, which just has some extra puzzles, which I skip. But 
Also a reminder that for each new game that comes out for a subscription, you can try to answer this questionnaire, which is basically just a test that you finish the game. And then they pick some winners every once in a while to send a gift certificate for. So we haven't been entering that, but we might one of these days. And then there's a card that comes actually there's two cards here we don't read those because sometimes they give away a little information about the villain and then here's our normal instructions telling us we all know this by now if you've watched any of the deadbolt streams they're always the same they're basically saying uh you can get hints at their facebook you use qr codes don't try to solve it until you've solved all the puzzles, etc. Okay, let's put all that aside and little stickers that they come. So they tend to have these stickers and cards that you don't use to solve the game, but are in each box. Um, beginning brief. This is a scary looking photo. Okay, here we go. As you flip through the pages of the Valley Falls Observer, you notice the article on page four about a missing man named Daniel Shoemaker. It's sad that this story didn't make the front page, but the reality is this happens so often that it's barely newsworthy. Valley Falls is filled with an above average amount of crime and weird happenings, but it's also a breeding ground for false reports and dead ends. Your job as a consulting detective with the Will Street Detective Agency allows you to see both sides of this tarnished coin. Because of the nature of your job, you're always open to new cases, but avoid sticking your nose into cases for which you haven't been hired. If your buddy Phil Herbert with the Valley Falls Police Department asks for your help, you always take the case. If someone comes into the agency and is willing to pay the retainer, you almost always take the case. Yet, you rarely veer from that path and investigate something that doesn't involve you and, more importantly, doesn't pay. However, rarely does not mean never. Sometimes the Valley Falls Observer is a reliable source of information, and other times it seems like nothing more than a grocery store tabloid. Yet on certain rare occasions, there are stories that are a little bit of both. The missing persons article in front of you catches your attention because it mentions a possible connection to the local legend of the Blue Moon Boogeyman. You have been following the case of the Blue Moon Boogeyman off the books since the beginning in 2012 and think there may be something to it despite the urban legend type vibe that goes along with the story. Legend has it that on a blue moon, the second full moon of a month, the Blue Moon Boogeyman comes to collect a trophy. This legend stems from a murder that took place during a blue moon in 2012. Because people go missing all the time in this town, it's tough to tell what connects with the legend and what doesn't. Yet, something about this story is different. For starters, Daniel Shoemaker's girlfriend reported that they were attacked before his abduction. So there is an eyewitness that could provide valuable information in finding the victim and in potentially shedding some light on the Blue Moon Boogeyman. One final note in the article mentions an event called the Boogeyman Bash tonight at the barn at Chesterfield Farms off Woodland Road. You hope the event is a gathering to find the missing Daniel Shoemaker. However, the name strongly suggests otherwise. Opening the bottom drawer of your filing cabinet, you start by reaching into the back and pulling out a notebook filled with scribbles, sketches, and scraps of paper. Keeping this quiet from everyone in the office, you flip through the pages to refresh your memory on the case before attending the event. Okay, so we have... Uh, urban legend of a killer, the Blue Moon Boogeyman, that started in 2012. And we're told what a Blue Moon is, which I didn't know. I know the Elvis Presley song, Blue Moon. 
but I didn't know that a blue moon is the second full moon of the month. Okay. Chat. Let's come in. Matt made us. Mr. Pretty says, will you consider doing a spiel preview like you did Gen Con preview? No one wanted my Gen Con preview, and I can't blame them. Since I'm not going to spiel, I will not be doing another eight-hour live stream. There are better people for that than me. All right, let's see. So let's just take all the evidence and see what we've got before we dig in. So we've got a bunch of loose documents. We've got a whole little booklet here. That's our... Whoa, look at that. There's a lot of writing in this. This looks like it's our note. And then we've got two envelopes. It looks like the last one is when we solve it, and one is do not open until instructed. Okay, well, you know, I've been uh, picking up more of these puzzle games, and as I do, the last couple deadbolts haven't been, uh, haven't knocked our socks off, but this is the kind of reason why I continue to come back to Deadbolt Mystery Society, that the attention spent on narrative is really on the high end when it comes to these kinds of puzzle games. And you can see there's a lot for us to read here. This is pretty cool. So for me, that's more enjoyable than the puzzles. Uh, okay, so this was not, we've been going through these games in order of documents, but it feels like this is our document that he just told us about. A notebook filled with scribbles, sketches, and scraps of paper. So I think we're going to start here. I think this is his notebook. 2012, Phil Herbert from VFPD told me they received an interesting 10-second call from a person who said their name was Tammy Gibbs. Or at least that's what they think the person said. The call was filled with static, and the caller was hysterical and talking extremely fast. Tammy Gibbs has a history of drug and alcohol offenses, so it makes sense that she was the caller. We just aren't sure how much to believe. Apparently, Tammy was driving by a farm when a masked monster attacked a lady on a bicycle. She mentioned something about a druid, too, whatever that means. A masked monster, a druid, has to be drugs, right? And then look, here's a little photograph that our detective has taped in. He's been following this case since the first murder. As I was watching the WTVF view news tonight, it turns out that Tammy's account of the events holds some truth. The Valley Falls Police Department found the body of Polly Lancaster in a cornfield at Chesterfield Farms. After the news report, I called Phil to see if they needed my assistance. He told me to hold off for now, but he did provide some information from the scene in case I wanted to be thinking about the situation. The body of Polly Lancaster was left in a cornfield for the crows. She was found with a major wound in her back from what appeared to be a large blade. This was most likely the cause of death. The most disturbing revelation was that Polly's vocal cords had also been removed post-mortem. It was a twisted thing to find. Unfortunately, a short thunderstorm between when the report was made and when we finally dispatched an officer to investigate the following day, washed away any possible footprints or other evidence. Polly was new to the area as she recently started her freshman fall semester at Valley Falls University. They contacted the university for information on next of kin, but they couldn't provide anything useful. We aren't sure if Polly doesn't have family or if she doesn't want anyone to know about them. Okay, reported by Tammy, Polly Lancaster is the person found. So she witnessed it, is that the idea? She was driving by, she saw someone attack Polly on a bicycle. 
Besides a small keychain wallet with ID and a little cash, the only other thing we found on her was a torn earth stash card in her pocket. Maybe you can investigate earth stash and see if it brings anything to the surface. Okay, earth stash, don't know what that is. After chatting with Phil the, next, the last few days, I researched Tammy and her legal troubles are longer than a pharmacy receipt. I managed to track her down and she wanted nothing to do with me. However, she was adamant that she never made a phone call to VFPD. Hmm. She was high on something or intoxicated at the time. It may be that she doesn't remember making the call. By asking a few people around town, I discovered that Earthstash is a coded message scavenger hunt style activity. You decode a location, then search to find a container, maybe buried or visible at the location. Geocaching is what we call that. Then you sign your name on an item or leave something behind in the container. I'm still uncertain of Tammy's involvement in this, if any, but I'll add her to my persons of interest list. I've also tried to assemble a collection of things related to the Druid, she mentioned. The Druid, unfortunately, is the local high school mascot. So all kinds of businesses use it in their names. Here's some examples. Dental Clinic calls itself the Flossing Druid. The Valley Falls Druid's Book Nook. Okay. Oh, more places that use... Druid in their name, Druid Wines and Spirits, Healing Druid, the Druid Diner, Druid Trucking Company, Druid Thrift Store, Sweet Treats, Druid Sweet Treats, Druid Magic, and Valley Falls High School. There's the mascot again. Okay, this will probably come up in some puzzle. Continuing through. Dennis Chesterfield is the owner of Chesterfield Farms. His property is the location of the murder of Polly Lancaster. I stopped by to speak with him to see if he had any information to clear things up, and he, he didn't. He honestly wanted me off his property. That's fair enough, since I'm not operating in a, an official capacity. I'm unsure if he was just a cranky man or had something to hide, but BFPD have listed him as a person of interest, which means I will too. I've been trying to learn more about Earthstash. It was created in 2008 by a group of college students and fizzled out around the edge of 2011. The rising demand for more tech-based GPS activities started popping up on the scene. And Earthstash's popularity decreased since it's a more primitive activity. I discovered that somewhere on Chesterfield Farms was one of the hidden locations. Here's what else I learned. There are multiple components to Earth's dash locations. One, the middle section is a cipher that requires a keyword. Two, the group of letters above the middle section are the starting point. The letters below the middle section are the heading. There is no encryption on these two sections, just missing letters. The first letter is, in fact, the first letter of the word and a number with each section indicates the number of letters in the word. In other words, if you wanted to write mailbox, you would write 7MLBX. And in this case, they've removed the vowels. The number you find once arriving at the starting location represents steps taken toward the heading. So you have a heading and a starting point and a number which tells you how many steps you take from the starting point in the heading to get to the place. So for example, if 20 was found on the mailbox, you would walk 20 steps from the mailbox towards the house to find the exact earth stash location. Okay, not GPS coordinates. This is a more primitive geocaching before they had GPS. The fourth letter from the top, middle, and bottom sections after solving will give you the combination to the container at the location. Okay, so that's 2012's notes. Now here's some notes from 2015. All right, so obviously this is something we're going to have to use to decode. We'll come back to this. All right, 
almost three years have passed since I've written in this notebook. There may be a second missing person after a new development today. I'm going to see what I can find. I was at Papa Luigi's Pizza today and saw a missing persons flyer for Allison Tracy. Turns out Miss Tracy worked at the restaurant. According to my waitress, Miss Tracy was last seen by her co-worker, Landon Starks. They were the two employees who closed the restaurant together two nights earlier, with Landon being the last person to see Miss Tracy. The VFPD questioned him about the night's events. When my waitress was ending her shift on the night of the incident, Miss Tracy realized she had a flat tire on her car and Mr. Starks offered to give her a ride home. The final statement from my waitress caught me by surprise. I don't think Landon did anything to her, but mm, it may have been the boogeyman, a young, attractive college student on a low-traffic road on a blue moon. You be the judge. Then with a scary grin, she started singing, One moon, two moon, white moon, blue moon. She stopped and let out an eerie laugh before leaving the table with my dirty dishes. Hmm, the boogeyman, I asked myself. Landon Starks didn't have to talk to me today, but he did. So that's something. It's slightly surprising he's still working with all the pressure on him. Here's his account of the evening with Miss Tracy. On the way to Allison's home, I pulled into Camp Grand Echo. People started a rumor that I tried to force myself onto her. That's not true at all, even though I do have a crush on her. After work, I planned to look for an earth stash box at the camp. None of my... Plans, however, involved a flat tire or taking Allison home. Before dropping her off, I decided to take her with me on my adventure. She seemed okay with it at first. I talked about the boogeyman and how it was a blue moon, and we might actually see the legend in the flesh. I, I don't believe in the legend, but I thought scaring her a little might make her grab onto me for protection. Boy, was I wrong. She became scared and angry and got out of the truck and started walking. I pleaded with her to get back in, but she wouldn't listen. I was irritated at this point and drove off, abandoning my earth stash plans. As I left the campgrounds, I thought I saw a figure in a gray mask. But when I looked a second time, no one was there. I guess the boogeyman was on my brain. What I did see was a vehicle with stars. I guess I should have done more to make sure Allison got home. I do regret that. Okay, so the 2012 victim had an earth stash uh, card in her pocket. And now 2015, three years later, he's also talking about earth stash. But it was his plans to go to the earth stash. She's got a flat tire. That's a common way that the killers get the people to take a ride with them. They but uh, they make a hole in their tire. So is that what he did just so he could get her in his car? He claims she got out and w tried to walk home. That's very suspicious. Mr. Starks was most likely the last person to see Miss Tracy alive. How does your mind play tricks on you like that, mistaking a person for a vehicle? Those things are nothing alike. And another reference to the boogeyman, I'm going to make Landon a person of interest. POR. So he's talking about the fact that he thinks, as I left the campgrounds, I thought I saw a figure in a gray mask. When I looked a second time, no one was there, but he does see a vehicle. I pulled into the Camp Grand Echo. People started a rumor I tried to force myself. All right, it'd be nice if we could get some witnesses to confirm that that actually happened. Okay, so they go to the campground. That's when she starts. That's when she go, runs off. He sees someone. This guy says, how does he see a person and then a car? 
Then he updates it. Months have passed. Still no signs of Miss Tracy. 2018. Okay, three years later. I walked around the Valley Falls University campus this evening in the frigid air to get some exercise. Stopping by a water fountain for a quick drink, I heard an enchanting lullaby being sun, sung. Felt like I was hearing a witch casting a hypnotic spell, but that wasn't the case, however. There was something strangely familiar about what I heard. One moon, two moon, white moon, blue moon. One moon, two moon, white moon, blue. On the first he wakes, on the second he hunts. If he comes for me, better duck and run. With a blade in hand and the sky aglow, he may find me out as his hunger grows. For tonight I'm his, I may never go home. Blue moon boogeyman, where do you roam? Okay, that's creepy. So he hears someone singing this. The mysterious woman I heard singing was Veronica Connors. According to her, there's a popular underground fascination on campus with the legend of the Blue Moon Boogeyman. You're curious to know why you don't know much about the legend. Well, it's easy. You aren't in college. The legend is just like when Facebook launched. Only people with official college email addresses could access the social media site. Now everybody and even their pets have Facebook profiles. So what started as a college legend may be coming to the surface. I heard the Boo Moon Boogeyman dresses in a dark blue robe, wears a white mask, and uses a knife to kill his victims. You see the Boo Moon Boogeyman by standing in the middle of a bridge during a blue moon and singing what you heard from me. We aren't on a bridge, but tonight is a blue moon, so be careful. And there's Veronica Connors. A bit of that goth eye makeup on. 2000. This is still 2018. Miss Connors' story about the boogeyman finally gives me an angle to investigate, and tonight is another blue moon. I'm both excited and worried. On the one hand, with another blue moon, I may be able to test the theory of the so-called blue moon boogeyman. On the other hand, the idea is only proven by another person being attacked, abducted, or murdered. Hold on. Let me stop myself and say I'm still questioning everything. The murder of Polly Lancaster could have been an isolated murder, and Allison Tracy could have simply been a runaway. Maybe she used the situation with Landon to her advantage and skipped town. Is there really a character out there called the Blue Moon Boogeyman? Seems sketchy. No new connections. Well, another blue moon has come and gone and nothing. How stupid could I have been? I found a remote bridge on a back road and recited the tune that Miss Connor sang. Did I see the blue moon boogeyman? Nope. I just found myself looking like an idiot. I bet she was just feeding me some garbage story she made up. Fast forward a few months, now a second blue moon in 2018 has come to pass and no new information. I think it's best I step away from this for a bit. 2020, the blue moon boogeyman did, in fact, return to Valley Falls last night. The murder of Catherine Highland was found in an almost, the body of Catherine Highland was found in an almost unrecognizable condition. Multiple large lacerations covered her body, most appearing to have been inflicted while she was in a defensive position. Deep stab wound to her abdomen seemed to be the cause of death. Wow, oh, that's rough. Miss Highland's vocal cords were removed. A crumpled note appeared where they once lived. The message read, Beware the boogeyman. Miss Highland's body was found in the middle of a Lucy of Lucille Lane by a VFPD officer on patrol. I consider myself to be pretty great at what I do, but I keep coming up empty. I found nothing new in the murder of Miss Highland. However, it is very interesting that the killer appears to now be taunting us. That was three years ago. Now it's this year. Here's the latest entry he's filled out. 2023. I read the missing persons article by Nikki Zimmer in the Valley Falls Observer today, and that forced me to pull this information out and dust it off. 
I found it interesting from the article that Mr. Shoemaker's friends called him the Scorpion. Daniel the Scorpion Shoemaker. I would love to hear the backstory on that. Hope he's as fierce and resilient as one toward his attacker. I hope that he is as fierce and resilient. As fierce and as resilient as one towards his attacker. He's thinking he's hoping he's hoping that Daniel is a scorpion towards his attacker, I guess. Here are all the blue moons and possible victims since the first case. Okay, Polly Lancaster in 2012, Blue Moon, Alice and Tracy. And then no attacks that the knows of in 2018. Then Catherine Highland in 2020, Daniel Shoemaker in 2023. So three years gap, three years gap, but these at this three years gap, nothing. I'm going to the event tonight. I hope to get new leads and see if I can help find Mr. Shoemaker. Maybe I can put together a solid persons of interest list between the event and my notes. I have to remember that I may continue adding and removing names from that list before it's solidified. I still feel like I'm missing something with these logos I pulled together. I wonder if the business names are important. It's bothering me now that I've revisited this information. So when we've got a puzzle, we don't know what it wants. And then another puzzle, use first and last and First and last initials only in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, it sounds like maybe there are other missing people. It wants us to fill in for this list. Persons of interest. That's interesting. It's not exactly clear what it wants, but it, it's saying that it thinks we're going to have to build out a list. And then once we have a good list, we'll be able to answer this and see if we got it right. I do want to look quickly through this. I'm interested in what the channel thinks about this long story narrative introduction. I just want to make sure I understand this part. So we've got our 2012, sorry, if we start from our introduction, we've got an article about the Blue Moon and Daniel Shoemaker. And she says they were attacked, and he's, is this guy gone missing? Is that right? Missing person. Okay, so they haven't found Daniel Shoemaker's body, but the girlfriend says that she was a witness to what? What does she say? They were attacked before his abduction. Okay, so that's our 2023. And then they find in 2012, Polly Lancaster's body. They think Tammy called it in. She's a drug user, but she denies having called it in. There's an earth stash card at the scene. That's 2012. Then it's investigated a bit. We're told how to use the stash. We're told the Holy Lancaster. Okay. Then in 2015, we've got a missing person. They don't ever find the body. Is that right? But he thinks he sees the boogeyman and a car with stars. Still no sign of her. Okay, then 2018, he runs into someone singing. He thinks there might be another attack, but there isn't in 2018. 
2020, they find another body. So they've got body found, missing person, body found, missing person. And the bodies that are found are left right out in public, right? The bodies that are found, he cuts the vocal cords. This time he actually put a note in her throat or something that said, beware the boogeyman. But it's weird that we've got on the blue moon a murder and violent murder with vocal cords removed and then a missing person. Murder, vocal cord, missing person. These are weird, like, it's two very different things happening three years apart. It's very strange that we've got these violent murders on a blue moon and then people with their vocal cords removed and then people that just go missing and that apparently are never, never found. Very strange. Let's check in with the chat. John says, out of curiosity, is this the campground from the cabin case? I think it might be. John says, pretty great setup. Nicholas says, thumbs up from me. Yeah, pretty great setup, I agree. And very sort of lengthy, elaborate, take your time setup. And one interesting thing is we've got some puzzles in here. We've got two puzzles here that we don't really understand. This one seems to me based on us developing a person's of interest. This says, I hope to get new leads. I'm hoping I can put together a solid person's of interest list between the event and my notes. I may continue adding and removing names from that list before it's solidified. And then I'm missing something with the logos. So I think this might be a puzzle having to do with these logos that maybe we could solve now. And then this is our list of people of interest. And we've got a couple of those here, right? We've got like Tammy is probably a person of interest. This guy we're told explicitly he's being put on the person of interest list, Dennis Chesterfield. Landon Starks, the last person to see one of our missing people. He's clearly a person of interest. And maybe her as well. So we have a bunch of people we could put on the persons of interest list already. We should. But then he said, this little hint says, Maybe I can put together a person of interest list between the event and my notes. So I think we've got the persons of interest from our notes. But maybe we need to collect a couple more and make a list of them. And I think, I'm guessing this is a different puzzle related to the business names. This might be solvable for us now, but we don't know how yet. Let's worry about it later. Nicholas says, I think we're going to find out this Daniel is not missing this latest person. Um, okay, so that's that. Let's see what else we have and see if there's any we want to read in a particular order. Let's take a look at this. Here's the Boogeyman Bash. Uh, the Legend Lives on, Barnet Chesterfield Farms, September 1st, 2023. Holly Lancaster, Allison Tracy, Harley Brown, Lisa Bears, Catherine Hyland, and Daniel Shoemaker. All right, so it seems that two people have been added to this poster that we don't know about. First victim, missing, we never heard about her, we never heard about her. 
found dead, missing. There's our two deaths. There's our two missings. These are new to us. The woman we heard singing said, hey, if you're not in college, you don't hear about this legend. So it seems like we've got two new victims that are not in our detective notes. Now, what does he say about this thing? He says, one final note. In the article, it mentions an event called the Boogeyman Bash tonight. That's what we're seeing the poster for. He says, well, I hope they're using it to go searching for Daniel Shoemaker, but they're not. They're obviously sort of celebrating this legend of this killer. Scan to play. So we've never seen this before. <laughs> But I did notice there's an item related to that. Let's see what this says. All right, so we've got a bunch of stuff here. Numbers. Looks like the killer is chasing people. We've got people running. Images of killer facing left and right, and peep girls and boys running left and right in cornfield. All right, let's see what this says. Head to head with the boogeyman, how to play. Look at only two characters at a time. If the killer and survivor are facing one another, take the number of points between the two and award them to the killer. This means the killer attacked the survivor. If the killer and survivor are facing in the same direction with the survivor running away from the killer, take the number of points between them and award them to the survivor. This means the survivor was able to run away. If the killer and survivor are facing opposite directions, it's assumed they didn't see each other and no points are awarded. All other combinations also gather no points. In other words, two victims or two killers, no points. At the end, the total number of killer points goes to the left keypad and the total number of survivor points go to the right. So it seems like we play this game they've set up here, and we use these rules to keep score, and we'll come up with a score on the left, a score on the right, following these rules, and then scanning this with the right answer will unlock something. Interesting. Uh, and Tina says, I guess the person of interest will be for later. The puzzles in here, but because it needs us to fill this out. Yes. All right. So it seems like we could do this now. I'm very curious who these two people are. Maybe we're going to hear, maybe if we win the game, we get to access a back room in the barn where we can see information about these two people. It's interesting, they're all women except Daniel Shoemaker. All right, let's put this aside for now. Let's look at what else we got here. We've got some music. So it looks like this is the playlist of L. Kirkland. I'm not sure we know who that is. Let's see. Chat wants me to look at something. And Nicholas says, I think you just apply the rules to what's on the other side. I see. You're saying the rules are from this. Yes. Uh, I see what you're saying. But then what does this mean? Sorry, what does this scan to play mean if it's not that game? It's a different game, you think, maybe? Okay, so maybe we can solve this right away. It says, 
Look at the two, look at two characters at a time if they're facing one another. All right, so two at a time, we look at their things, and then we look at these two, and then these two, and then these two, and so on, and calculate our score. Okay, so maybe this is something completely different. All right, back to this for a second. I'm just going to look through our evidence, then we'll take a little break. Okay, so this is someone's... Oh, the playlist for Boogeyman Bash by L. Kirkland's playlist. Let's see what we got. Born Under a Bad Side. Born Under a Bad Sign by Albert King. This is a great blues song. I don't know this song. Bad Moon Rising by Creedence Clearwater Revival. We know that song. That's a famous song. Bark at the Moon, Ozzy Osbourne's song. I don't know. Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. Moonchild by Iron Maiden. I don't happen to know that song. Dark Side of the Moon. Man on the Moon. Walking on the Moon. And Fly Me to the Moon. Okay. And then we've got Times. Don't know how we would use this for a puzzle, but presumably we would. We've got another odd list of letters and numbers. This looks like it might be related to our Earth Stash puzzles. Possibly. Then we've got some interviews that we conduct at the boogeyman bash all right let's not read this yet and we've got two little postcards blue moon boogeyman is my homeboy i'm not sure what these are t-shirt salesman these are people we meet at the boogeyman bash it looks like everything that's available to us now is at the Boogeyman Bash. And we've got some cutout pieces that say, charge up the Boogeyman. Help get the Boogeyman power so he will be fully charged to hunt on the blue moon. So it looks like these are pieces we're going to cut out and assemble into something. Feels like this is some college game. Well, we can start with the one that we think we know how to do and then maybe check out this one or maybe we should scan this one at first but let's take a break first uh let's see brian lynn says is it possible the number is the word number or the letter number I'm not sure what you're referring to one of the tricky things because of the youtube delays is that when you type a comment about something I just said, I'll probably not see it for a while and won't remember, won't realize what you're talking about. So when you make a comment, make a comment that says like <laughs> the entire background information needed. Right now, it feels like we know enough to work on this puzzle and enough to be curious about this puzzle. But let's take our first break. I'll see you in eight minutes. We'll get back. We'll try to attack one of these puzzles and see if we can make progress. Very compelling case, very interesting. I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back. Jonathan was saying he thinks we should scan the poster first to see if it may be just a multimedia rather than a game. It says scan to play. All right, so let's try it. Let's 
go to our camera here. Looks like maybe Jonathan was right. Okay, so let me, okay, so hopefully we'll be able to hear this together. I'm not hearing anything. All right, so I didn't hear anything. It didn't look like it was important for me to hear anything, but let's just uh, see if I can't fix that. Uh, it seems like maybe the important thing there was what she saw inside the box. Let's see if we can't. Or this. I mean, this looks like it's a clip from a movie that they're making at this boogeyman bash. So it's not like this is a real scene from a real crime but she's waiting at the cornfield she's trying to track she's tracking the locate okay so this is the important part okay so what have we got here she's searching for this earth stash and what has she found can we zoom in on that no i can't zoom in on that oh a little bit Okay, what do we see here? La Fontana and some license plates. I mean, we don't know who made this video. We think it's of probably some homemade student homemade film that they're celebrating doesn't look like and then there's the killer chasing her with a big knife all right so i'm not sure what we were to get out of that except the stuff that we found in the that she saw in the stash but it sounds like that killer might be killing people who go to get that stash Okay, and then, and Tina's making a comment about the yellow pieces of paper being related to the songs. Well, let me come back to that first. Let's do this. We don't know what that's about. Let's do the one puzzle that we think we know how to solve. All right, let's take a look at this. Let's see the rules again. Okay, so if there... We're going to do, so you were right that that was just a video, not the game. So here's the self-contained game. It says take two people at a time. We're going to accumulate a score for the boogeyman and a score for the survival. That's how, survivor, that's how we're going to answer this puzzle. Okay, if they're facing one another, then you add the points to the killer because he attacked them. If they're facing in the same direction, the survivor ran away. Sorry. If they're facing in the same direction with the survivor running away, then we give it to the survivor because the survivor escaped. And then everything else, no point. Okay, so let's see. 
Here is, they're facing in the same direction, so the survivor got away, right? So we're going to put that in the tally for the survivor. And then two, sur two victims, nothing happens, nothing happens. Now this person gets, isn't seen. What was the rule? If they're facing the same direction, survivor running away, then give them to the survivor. Okay, so in this case, they don't see each other, so nothing happens. Here we've got killer and survivor running towards each other, so we give that to the killer. No score. No score. The killer gets 29 here. Here, no score. No score. Here, the survivor escapes, so we give that to the survivor. Here, no score. No score. No score. No score. No score. No score. Here, the survivor escapes. So we give that to the survivor. No score, no score. This one, the killer got him, so that's five points for the killer. No score, no score, 44 points for the killer. That's my reading of the rules. Let me just check that that's right. Uh, that's different than what Antina says. All right, let's see if we got, let me make sure I understand it. Okay, if they're facing one another, then you give it to the killer. That's simple. If, the, if they're facing in the same direction with the survivor running away, then you give it to the survivor. Everything else, if they're facing opposite directions, no point. Otherwise, no point. So I think this is my total here. So I get 10, 15, 9... 10, 19, 1, 8, 9, 10, 14. I get 149 and 5, 6, 15. I get 149 to 150. I get the whole score. Award the points between them, meaning the points in the number between them. So I get 149 to 150, which is a reasonable kind of score. So shall we try that? And if it's wrong, we'll go back and we'll double check it, yeah? All right, so let's, let's scan it. It's very possible I was... Uh, it's very possible that I was careless and miss something, but we'll find out in a second. Okay. Oh, can you see that? All right, so there's our PDF. All right. All right, so the password says numbers only, no spaces. So I'm gonna type in one, one, four, nine, one, five, oh. And we're going to say, okay, and that was it. Okay, so that was the right answer. We're going to save it without security so that we can read it later. Okay, let's see what we got when we decoded that. See, now that wasn't too hard. The survivor won this round and lived to see another day. Maybe the same will be said of Daniel Shoemaker. No body has been found, which means there's still a chance he's alive. I told you that if I won, I would share the information I knew. I'm a lady of my word. I run in so many circles that I hear so many things, some of which I hear is just rubbish. But I have a pretty good filter on what is fact and what is fiction. One of the two original suspects in the case is no longer alive. October 23rd, 2012 holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to myself. Meanwhile, it's hard to believe the one abusing their body is still up and kicking. It isn't fair. 
But enough about all that. Now that I've told you what I know, please go and enjoy the rest of the event. Okay, so this is, I guess, a person at this event. We don't know who or why she's talking to us. Let me close the rest of these from previous cases. Okay, so she says, I have some information. She says, one of the original two suspects is no longer alive in the original case. And then she says, the one that abuses her body, their body is still kicking. Okay, so that's their drug. She's saying that the druggie is still alive, presumably. And then there's another witness in the 2012 that's dead then. So she must be talking about Dennis Chesterfield. Is that what she's saying? One of the two original suspects is no longer alive. So our 2012 case, I think Tammy was one. And Dennis Chesterfield had to be the other one, right? So... Tammy Gibbs. And then Den Dennis Chesterfield. And I think she's saying that Dennis Chesterfield must be dead by now. Is she still on the interview sheet? Is she on the interview sheet? Says Jonathan. Tammy is not. Ah, but look who is. Okay, so maybe we should start here before we go too much further. Let's, we've just talked to Catherine Coburn. Okay, let's, let's read this. Would you like to play one of our games here? I think you would do well at it. Pin the mask on the boogeyman or missing booth. Those were both Leonard's ideas. I'm so thrilled he let me help with this event. He knows that I love to have fun, so he put me in charge of the games. My favorite color is red, but you're giving me the blues if you don't play. See what I did there? If you play head-to-head -head with the boogeyman and get the answer correct, I'll tell you what information I know about the legend. You might think I don't know anything, but you're obviously, you've obviously never spent much time at my bridge club and in the bingo hall I frequent. The info learned there is as good as most of the secrets you would get on the street, guaranteed. Okay, so we just talked to her, we played her game, we solved her thing, and she gave us our information that one of the suspects is dead and the drug addict is still alive. I guess we should read the rest of these then. So we get to the boogeyman bash, and let's read this. Unfortunately, when you get to the boogeyman bash, you see exactly what you were expecting to see. The gathering isn't an event to find a lost soul. It's an event to glorify a monster. White and blue streamers adorn the barn rafters, while posters highlighting the event and the missing person's wallpaper, the interior walls. A freaky video plays on a projector screen hanging from one end of the barn. Booths and games are positioned in different places. You seem to be in some psychotic fantasy festival for urban legend and true crime fanatics. Uncertain of what you're fully experiencing, you stroll around the premises and talk with others in attendance. So I guess we should have read this first. It would have been nice if there was a way to have told us that. But this explains the video we saw. They're just playing it at the bash. Um, okay, and then we've got a bunch of people. So let's look at our interviews. We're going to now walk over and talk to Leonard Kirkland, the event organizer. Welcome. No need to be shy. Don't you just love it? 
I've been dreaming of this event for so many years. The Blue Moon Boogeyman first came to town when I was at VFU. The energy of that time was so electric on campus and my fascination was born. I've been planning this bat bash ever since Catherine Highland was found murdered three years ago. All I needed was the perfect time, and that time is now. After all, someone has been killed or gone missing the previous five blue moons. It was inevitable that it would happen again. I'm well aware that my fascination with this legend makes me a person of interest, but I don't care. I know the boogeyman has Daniel. I know it. And please enjoy the video. I directed it myself. The legend lives on. Okay, so if we're keeping track of people of interest, Leonard Kirkland has just said his fascination with this whole thing makes puts him on the persons of interest list. Remember, that's one of our things we're trying to do. And Tina says, I wasn't expecting such a voice for Leonard. Well, sometimes the, you can't judge a book by the cover. Nikki Zimmer, a reporter. Oh, she was the person who wrote the article that we read. If you look at our introduction, we're reading an article by Nikki Zimmer. So let's talk to her. Nikki Zimmer, reporter for the Valley Falls Observer. You read my article. I'm happy to hear that. I never know if people read them or not. Well, that's not entirely true. When people read them and hate them, I know about it immediately. The internet can be a nasty place. You look familiar, but I can't pinpoint where I know you from. I've been working with my little Lenny since I met him at a speed dating event. Our romance is strong, but our passion for the Blue Moon Boogeyman is even stronger. With his great mind and our combined research, scouring missing person posters, we figured out the identity of victims three and four. He is so smart. Hasn't he done a great job putting on this event? I'm thankful for Stephen letting us use the barn, but I've had suspicions about him being connected to the case. He's a person of interest to me and should be for you, too. So she's talking about Lenny. That's her boyfriend, Leonard. And she just put someone else on our person of interest list. Stephen. But is she a person of interest? It doesn't say so, but maybe someone else is going to tell us that she is. She's the writer. All right, let's look at our next person, Dylan Hernandez, an event attendee. I really hate it for the families of the missing people. Daniel's parents were here for a moment, but they stormed out when they saw what this event was truly about. Uh, they came here hoping people would want to wanted to help find their son and were instead presented with a shrine to a murderer. Do I agree with the event? No. Do I feel for the hurting family? Absolutely. What am I doing here? Well, my sister was killed by a drunk driver when she was about Daniel's age. An event created a hole inside me I've never been able to fill. Tried almost everything possible using what I call weapons of self-destruction. Each attempt on my part just made the hole larger. What I haven't tried is using positivity and effort to benefit others difficult to pour from an empty cup, but this may be the place I need to fix me. The full moon reminds me of the halo I know my sister is wearing now. She was such an angel. Doesn't seem like he's a person of interest. Okay, here's another attendee, Kristen Kennedy. I've listened to so many podcasts, I'm basically a detective. I'm excited about solving this crime and checking out all these cool booths. Have my eyes on a murderer makes me happy sticker at the merch booth. When it comes to solving crimes, I'm all business. But I wouldn't mind learning the boogie man boogie line dance they're teaching here. Give me a couple glasses of wine and the dance moves will start flowing. 
All the fun, however, is secondary to the reason I'm here. We need to catch the killer. And that means asking the right questions, like... Why would the Blue Moon Boogeyman attack a male this time when every victim up until this point was a female? Why change it up? I agree with you, Kristen. I was wondering the same thing myself. She doesn't seem like a person of interest. But here's Stephen, who the other person mentioned was a person of interest. He's the current owner. This confirms our other theory about that the previous owner died. Even Chesterfield, current owner of Chesterfield Farms. I'm not much for big events in Hoopla. I'm a simple man. Faith, family, and farming are what make me happy. I tried being a suit after graduating college, but it wasn't for me. This farm has been in my family for multiple generations. Mr. Kirkland asked me about using the barn for the event. It wasn't my first choice because... You're on the property where the legend began, right out there in the cornfield. Nobody wants to be associated with that kind of story. However, Mr. Kirkland offered me 3000 bucks to use the place because of its significance and money talks. Over the last decade, making a living by farming has been increasingly difficult, especially since my father was a person of interest. So if taking the money to keep things rolling for a little longer means sacrificing my pride, then so be it. Okay, so Stephen Chesterfield is our, uh, another person of interest. And we're removing the father who was a person of interest but is dead now. So he doesn't go on our list. Now we've got Mary Louise Ennis. She's handling refreshments. She's got a QR code. Can I offer you something to eat or drink, detective? Shock, yes, I know who you are, but how I know is not important at this time. I volunteered to help and they put me behind the counter here. I have some information that might be useful. We don't really know each other that well, though. Give me a few moments to write something down for you. If you can figure out the message on this yellow piece of paper and tell me what I've been called, you'll find out its significance. The information I have for you might be music to your ears. Okay, so now we know where this yellow piece of paper came from. It came from little Mary Louise, and she does reference music. So that makes sense. And then we already read Catherine. All right, so let's work on Mary Louise Ennis's puzzle. She's written this for us, and she tells us that it's probably related to music. So let's see, what have we got here? PF9 Pink Floyd. Probably ninth letter, right? Let's take a look at the letter counts here. FS is going to be... Frank Sinatra, AK is Albert King. Okay, so let me just quickly see if any of these numbers are telling us that it's probably in the song, right? So, because Ghost 8 does, Ghost doesn't have eight letters. So, it's going to be the letter in the song name. So, let us do it this way. Okay. That's the best way we have to do this together. Okay, so PF9 is going to be Pink Floyd 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's an I. You tell me if you think I've got anything wrong. Uh, FS4 is Frank Sinatra 4, which is an M. AK15 is Albert King 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's an I. LVP is Beethoven 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 
Nine, ten. Yes, tell me if you think I can get any of these wrong. Even if I get one or two wrong, we'll see if we can't fill it in. Okay, Cretan's clear water is ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I miss G8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, M, F, S, 3, is a, a Y, Pink Floyd, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, S, I, M, 7, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. G seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is probably gonna be I miss my sister. Uh A K three. Let's see, where did I leave off though? G seven was sister eight over nine one two three four five six seven eight nine I think that's a T Sinatra five one two three four five E A K three is R I miss my sister and then. Iron Maiden five one two three four five C. What is this R two? O. Frank Sinatra two. That's L. Iron Maiden eight one two three four five six seven eight I. TP five three four five zero zero thirteen O O thirteen Ozzy Oz one thirteen one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven thirteen and One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I miss my sister C O L I I N G. I must have done something wrong there. Um this is C C R thirteen. We'll have to come back to that since I sure we did something wrong there. Okay, F S eleven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven is an M. Pink Floyd eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven is P. Iron Maiden five. One, two, three, four, five. C G one is an H. Just gonna put that there so we can find our place. AK 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Sorry, 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I am 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ozzy Osbourne 4. Okay, Pink Floyd four, one, two, three, four, G five, one, two, three, four, five, F S five, one, two, three, four, five.
Okay. This says Chickadee, which is a nickname you might. My sister, this is going to be an A. Okay, I miss my sister calling me Chickadee. So that's the answer to that. She says, find out, tell me what I've been called. Okay. So this is a good example how you make one mistake, you can see it in context, and that's chickadee. All right, so we know what her sister called her, and Mary Lou Ennis, is that one of our victims' sister? No, I don't know why. She just misses her sister calling her chickadee. All right, let's go and answer this one. All right. Can we get rid of these? No. Okay. So. Chickadee. Good job, detective. I very much miss hearing my older sister's voice. I was her chickadee and she was my dancing queen. Oh, did she love to dance. Unfortunately, she was taken away from us too early. You'll recognize her as missing person number three, Carly Brown. She went out to look for those stupid hidden boxes and never returned. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who ever looked for her. My, our mother wasn't very present while we were growing up, and I never knew my father. Even though we were half-sisters, she was all I had and I knew something was wrong when I couldn't get in touch with her. Police department did nothing to find out what happened to her, but I can't entirely blame them. There was nothing for them to go on. I had no evidence to convince them she didn't run away. They knew the kind of crowd she hung around with. They knew she stole things. They knew she stole things on occasion. They knew that she had a tendency to get into trouble and were convinced she would turn up sooner or later. I knew the sorts of things she did too, but I still loved her in spite of it all. I also knew that something bad had happened to her. I felt it in my gut. I plastered the town with missing posters, but never received any leads. After hitting multiple dead ends with my investigation, I packed a bag and left home. I was frustrated with the whole situation. It drove me nuts seeing my mother doing nothing while my sister was missing. But uh, one thing I did manage to find was that in 2018, Mr. Pizza studied abroad in Italy from December 27, 2017 to May 12, 2018. I have mixed feelings about this event, but I'm looking at it as getting one step closer to finding my sister. Sometimes the biggest fanatics are the most unhinged people. Okay, so we've got a couple pieces of information here. First of all, we know Carly Brown is our missing person from 2008. We don't know when in 2000, sorry, 2018. We don't know when she went missing in 2018, right? We don't have a date here. She's just gone missing. But then she says, Mr. Pizza, who's going to be the nickname of one of our suspects, was in Italy from 12-27-2017 to May 12, 2018. This is probably going to give this person an alibi. Now, do we know who Missing Pizza, uh, Mr. Pizza is? Yes. I think we're talking about Leonard. Sorry, not Leonard, Landon Starks, who works at the pizza place. So if we can verify that Carly Brown went missing 
during the time period of 2018 when this guy was away in Italy, we would be able to eliminate him. By the way, there's Carly. And there's her sister. Okay, I can see the resemblance. Um, but we don't know when Carly went missing yet. So we can't positively do that. Uh, the channel says Starks wasn't there from March 2018. Oh, Jonathan is reminding me we actually do have the dates in 2018. Good point, which Antina already figured out. Okay. So if we go to 2018, we don't know when they went missing, but we're assuming it's on a blue moon, and we're told what the dates were that the blue moons happened. Where were we told? Here's 2018. Where are we told about the 2018 date of the blue moon? Is it in the back here? Yes. Okay. All right. So 2018 was either in January or March. So our guy was in Italy for both of those. Thirty-one eighteen and three. 31, 18. So assuming Carly went missing on one of these dates, our Italy guy is ruled out. He has an alibi. If we believe her, which probably we do. Okay, so that would get rid of Landon Stark from our suspect list. Okay, good. All right, so that's that. that puzzle and that puzzle so we have the puzzle in our two puzzles in our notebook and we have two more people at this boogeyman bash and then we have this we won't do this yet let's see what we can make out of these oh that's the charge of the boogeyman that's going to be that all right let's take a look at this so our woman just said, who, who told us she had her eye on a shirt? Kristen Kennedy. Says she wants a murder makes me happy sticker. And a she wanted a shirt too, didn't she? I thought she wanted a shirt. She wants a sticker. All right, let's see what we got here. He's at the merch booth. Step right up and tell me how I can help you. Would you like one of our fine t-shirts or how about a boogeyman plush doll? When you've made up your mind, I'm ready to help. Blue Moon Boogeyman is my homeboy. We saying, what do we want? When you've made up your mind, I'm ready to help. Um, she wants a murder makes me happy sticker. This seems like a different thing. Is this a standalone puzzle? Tell me how I can help you. Would you like one of our t-shirts? Or how about a plush doll when you've made up your mind? That's weird. Let me put that aside for now because I'm not sure how to answer that. Let's look at this one. Charge up the boogeyman, which sounds like it's related to this. Right? These are the same symbol. Let's see if this tells us how to do this. One of the strangest rumors about the boogeyman is that he steals the life force from his victims to sustain himself. Do you think you have what it takes to fully charge up the Blue Moon Boogeyman? 
Input the seven digit code in order from the power supply to the boogeyman's mask. If you're correct, you'll win a prize and the boogeyman will spare your life out of gratitude for powering him up. If you're incorrect, the boogeyman will hunt you for eternity and you'll never stop looking over your shoulder. No pressure. All right, let's play. All right, so clearly that wants us to solve this. So let's punch these out and do this puzzle. I'm sure if I look in the chat, I'm going to get told about the answer to that merchandise one guy. So I'm not going to look in the chat yet. All right, let's do this puzzle. So we know this kind of puzzle. We're going to go and make the connection, then read off the numbers. We're trying to charge him up. We've got, let's see if you can see this. Okay. All right. Green, black, yellow, red is the order we want. So probably they may have to be offset. Here's our green and black though. Green and black, green and black. Okay, so here's our green, black. I guess, I don't know what that, I don't know if we should be worrying that there's no, is it this? I don't know what this little thing is here. I mean, if we have to do that, oh, here I see. Okay, so there's the connection there. Clean up a bit here. Okay, so there's the connection there. And then we saw this one probably goes here. And then at this junction point, it turned into blue. No. Okay, there's that. Black, green. Looks like probably that. And then looks like we're going to have to split off some stuff here. What have I done wrong? Nothing. Okay, there's that. All right, and there's that. Probably like that. Like that. Uh, I like that. Okay, so there's our puzzle. We've charged him up. And now we just read off the numbers. One, five, seven, eight, six, zero, nine. Is that right?
Okay, the instructions are input the seven digit code in order from the power supply to the node. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, there's our seven digit code. All right, let's save this without protection. We can come back to it. Okay, and now we're going to scan this. All right. Okay, and so the code is one, five, seven, eight, six, zero, nine. Congratulations, says Peter. You fully charged up the boogeyman. This is good news for you, because now your life is spared. However, you will... Now, you have now powered up a monster, and someone else will meet their demise. Oh, well. Better them than you, right? Do you know why the Blue Moon Boogeyman hunts on the Blue Moon? I have a theory about that. Now, first off, I don't think he has electric power like the game suggests. That would imply that he's more than human, and I don't really believe that. But I do think there is some truth in the implications of the game. Maybe our friendly neighborhood Boogeyman wakes up on the first full moon charges up during the month, and then is energized and ready to hunt during the blue moon. It's as good a theory as any, don't you think? My light is blinking weird. That normally means when it can't connect. Never had that actually happen before. I've coded this little light that alerts. Uh, but occasionally it <laughs> does some colors that I forgot what I coded to mean. Okay, so he's saying he charges up for the month and then he attacks. He says, in farming, it's said that seeds will absorb more water during the full moon when more moisture is pulled to the soil's surface. I personally feel like a blue moon amplifies this tenfold. However, I have no scientific data to back this up. In this case, the boogeyman acts as the seed and the rush of the kill is greatly enhanced on the blue moon. Or maybe I just have too much time on my hands and need to find a different hobby than inventing wild ideas about the qualities of a killer that's probably more urban legend than fact. Anyway, you look like you could use a new t-shirt. Go check out the merch booth. If you tell whoever is working the booth a three-part secret password, They'll give you a $5 discount on t-shirts and a free Murder Makes Me Happy sticker. Who doesn't want one of those? The password is the event organizer's nickname, plus the number of times the word moon appears in the boogeyman chant, plus the second word, I see you can't see that, plus the second word, in the title of the line dance. All right, so we need a password. This is the answer to the other puzzle. This is why we didn't try to solve that other puzzle because we went to the one we could solve and now that's given us the answer to the other one. Okay, so we're told it's a three-part password, he says. Okay, so we start, it wants the event organizer's nickname. All right, let me move through this, okay. Now, who's the event organizer's nickname? Well, it's Leonard, and his nickname is Lenny. So it's the first part of our thing was Lenny. Okay. Plus the number of times the word moon appears in the boogeyman chant. Okay, well, that is we've got here from our very fetching looking Veronica Connors. The number of times moon appears. Okay, let's see what we got here. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. All right. Number of times the word moon appears in the chant, plus the second word in the title of the line dance. Okay. And who wants to do line dance? It's our little vixen drinker here, Kristen Kennedy. Is she the person who tells us the name of the line dance? The Boogie Man Boogie. The second word is boogie. So it seems like our password is Lenny Eight Boogie. I think that's right. Any disagreement with that? If that's correct, we can now give him the password. No cats, no spaces. All right, let's try this. I'm not sure if we should be spelling out the letter eight, but let's try it. I need to save this as unprotected. Okay, let's try this. Hmm, boy, that doesn't want to scan that. Okay. Well, I think that that is L E N N Y. L E N N Y. And then the number eight. And then B O O G I E. Let's see if that works. No. Okay, let's try spelling it out. L E N N Y E I G H T B O O G I E. That was it. When you mention the password Lenny Eight Boogie to the guy at the merch booth, he lets out a hysterical laugh. You're confused until you say the password out loud Lenny Eight Boogie. You look over at Peter and see him grinning from ear to ear. Oh, Peter's been messing with you, the merch booth guy says with a chuckle. Now, what did he promise you would, ha would happen if you came over here and told me that? I'll make good on it. True to his word, the guy at the merch booth gives you exactly what Peter promised. You're excited about your new Blue Moon Boogie is my homeboy t-shirt. Which is right there. And your Murder Makes Me Happy sticker. But the merch booth guy doesn't stop there. He has more to give you, this time in the form of information. Okay, let's take it. Says, you know, a lot of people think Leonard is behind the whole legend. Truth is, he's harmless. He may be a little on the fanatical side, but he wouldn't hurt a fly. I mean that in the most literal sense. If he finds an insect inside his house, he scoops it up and sets it free. I was actually at Leonard's house when he came up with the idea of the Boogeyman Bash. It was Halloween 2020. We were at his house for a costume party. He was dressed like Dracula, and I was dressed like Super Mario. He was a little depressed at the time because his girlfriend broke up with him. Trying to cheer him up, I asked him what got him excited about life. Immediately, he perked up and started talking about the Blue Moon Boogeyman and ideas he had for a big event. And it's crazy to think that while we were enjoying punch and finger foods at his party, Catherine Highland was actually being murdered by the Blue Moon Boogeyman. Okay, so he's giving us a timeline alibi. 
for himself, but more importantly for Leonard. And that's because Catherine Highland was killed on Halloween, October 31st of 2020. And this guy is talking to Leonard during that time. So our merch guy alibis Lenny on October 31st, 2020. So I guess the way we're reading that is now he's no longer a person of interest because he's alibied. Is that right? I mean, he's no longer a suspect for us. But I think that also means we're taking him off our persons of interest list. I'm not 100% sure about that. So here's the interesting thing, though. We've now solved all the puzzles that we have access to. Except for the two in our notebook. And the two in our notebook. And then we can't open envelope one until we're told. So that's it. We've just got the two in our notebook to solve. One wants our list of persons of interest, which I guess we now can create. And the other one wants the logo business name. I still feel like I'm missing something with the logos I pulled together. I wonder if the business names are important. Well, we don't know. We may have enough to answer this question. Persons of interest. I'm not sure about this. Feels like we probably have enough to solve this, but I don't know what it wants. But um, let's take our next break first. I'll see you in eight minutes. Let's see if we can get envelope one opened when we come back.
Okay, we're back. Two puzzles left to solve before we open up envelope one, if all goes well. We probably have enough persons of interest. Probably to do that, but not for sure. So if we think we can solve this one. I'm going to the event. I hope I can put together a solid persons of interest list. And then it's reminding us, I'm probably going to be adding and removing the names. Okay, good. So that, that clar that's a little hint that we were right to remove people once they have alibis. So probably we do this. Then he says, I still feel like I'm missing something with those logos I pulled together. I wonder if the business names are important. It is bothering me now that I have revisited this information. What have we got here? I see a bunch of dates on some of these. Let's take a look at these and see if we can make sense of these. The Flossing Druid Dental Clinic. The Valley Falls Druids Book Nook. Druids, Wines, and Spirits, 1993. <clears throat> These are just places that businesses that use the mascot in their names, use the word Druid, because one of our witnesses said Druid. The Druid Diner. Healing Druid, Health and Wellness, Druid Trucking Company, Sweet Treat, Thrift Store, And here's the one that DJ in the comments said, Hey, has any, have you guys noticed that there's stars in this logo? Commercial cleaning company. And here's the Valley Falls High School using the mascot. So the stars are very interesting because one witness looked back and saw a van with stars. Now, the reason we got onto this idea of looking for the Druid in the logos is because the caller mentions something about a Druid. A masked monster attacked a lady on a bicycle. She mentions something about a Druid. So, I wonder if the point isn't that did she also see a car? Our guy, our other witness said he saw he turned around, he saw a blue man and then he turned around, it was gone. It's here. As he left the campgrounds, I thought he saw a figure in a gray mask. When I looked a second time, there was none there. I guess the boogie was on my brain. What I did see was a vehicle with stars. 
So is are they both seeing this van? One guy sees stars and one woman says she sees the word druid. Is that what's happening? It's kind of weird though, because the way the question is phrased, he says, I feel like I'm missing something with the logos. I wonder if the business names are important. not clear what it wants from us here. Let's see. We might try to guess that it's the magic shop and see if that's what it's talking about. What would the answer be? Druid magic. Yes. The answer to that would be druid magic, if that's what we're supposed to guess here. Let's see if we can answer this one first. All right, so our persons of interest, let's look at our total list. Um, so, do we want, most of the people we looked at, we were explicitly told that they're on our person of interest list. Where's our starting list? There is no starting list. Do we put Tammy on our person of interest list? Surely we do, right? So Tammy Gibbs, she's the first one on our person of interest list. She's still alive. Dennis Chesterfield, we took him off our person of interest list because he died. Then we've got Landon Starks. We're taking him off our list because we know he has an alibi. What about this woman? Do we put her on our person of interest list? Or is she just a witness? Seems like our real people of interest with. So Tammy Gibbs, our first caller. And then maybe Veronica Connor? I don't know. What is your reading of that? Does she go on our list just because she was a person singing? Seems like not, right? Veronica Connors. I don't think she's on our persons of interest list. Uh, but... Leonard is got an alibi. He was in at a Halloween party. Nikki Zimmer was never on our list. Dylan Hernandez was never on our list. He's just an attendee. Kristen Kennedy is never on our list. 
Steven is, though, right? Did he have an alibi that we crossed him out? Lenny and Landon are out. So I guess that Stephen Chesterfield is still on our list. Um, these people never belonged on our list. So I just have two people on our list then. Stephen Chesterfield, the son, and Tammy, the original witness. Is there something else we're missing in terms of people being persons of interest? It seemed to tell us when everyone's a person of interest. Okay, so... What about Nikki? He's a person of interest to me, should be for you. I only have two people on my persons of interest, this guy. The son of the farm owner, which is very suspicious since that's where the thing is planted. And then Tammy Gibbs, who we aren't even told. That's a lady on a bicycle. And we're not we're told everyone else we're putting on our person of interest, but not we're not told her, but we're suspicious of her because she's the witness for the 2012. But what about this guy's girlfriend? There's an eyewitness shoemaker's girlfriend. We don't know who that is though. What about this person? It was a little confusing to me. Shoemaker is our recent guy. We're told he has a girlfriend that was a witness. But we haven't run into her yet. We've got a bunch of people, but they don't seem to be persons of interest except for two. I mean, first and last initials only in alphabetical order by last name. I mean, if we've got our two people, then we've got Stephen Chesterfield, SC, and then Tammy Gibbs, TG. We could try that. It just seems weird that there's only the two of them. Mm. 
Any other thoughts in the channel? I mean, maybe we're not supposed to do this yet. Maybe we're supposed to do this. John says, maybe if we solve the logo puzzle, we'll learn one of the other people works for Magic Druid. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we can try solving the Druid, the logo puzzle. It's awfully weird, though, but we can try it. I mean, it's a very, it was a very clever observation in the channel about the stars. We could try it. All right, let's try it. Let's see what happens. So this is the logo puzzle. So it just tells us, I wonder if the business names are important. It's bothering me now that I've revisited this information. So we're thinking that maybe the answer that it wants is just the name of this one place. So we're going to try Druid Magic. D-R-U-I-D. R-U-I-D. M -A Let's try again. D-R-U-I-D. M-A-G-I-C. So what do you think? Is this going to be the right answer? Or is it going to be some other puzzle related to the rest? I think this is going to be the right answer. Let's see. Well done. Well done, DJ, in the channel. Figured out stars in the logo, and that was the answer. When you connect the Druid comment from Tammy Gibbs and the Stars comment from Landon Starks, you end up with Druid magic. Well done. You look online for the business information and see that Jeremiah Lewis is the owner. You decide to give Druid magic a call. You pretend to be an interested customer and find as much information as possible. Here are the things you learn. Jeremiah Lewis is an entrepreneur and the sole owner and employee of Druid Magic. He drives a white Sprinter van featuring the Druid Magic logo on each side. He services customers in Valley Falls and surrounding Thornmire County. Even though he's a one-man show, he's looking at expanding his territory. He tells you his motto is, why sleep where you can clean? Why sleep when you can clean? Why sleep when you can clean? You think his motto is silly because you love to sleep and hate to clean. Nevertheless, he has now become a person of interest. All right. Anything in that photo we should notice? I don't know what all this blue stuff on this photo is. Should that concern us? He's got gloves. All right. So Jeremiah Lewis. All right. I think we should take a moment to appreciate that little puzzle because it wasn't a puzzle. It was real pure deduction. And uh, we like that. I like that better than the puzzle game. So the fact that it was a very clever observation from one of the channel members about the stars really makes it work. And you could see how you could get stuck on that. But boy, is that fun that that was the puzzle, that that was the answer rather than an abstract logic puzzle. So now let's return, now that we've added him to the persons of interest, can we return to this question? Who is on our person of interest list? Is it now, we know Stephen Chesterfield is on a person of interest list. And we now know Jeremiah Lewis is on the person of interest list. Is Tammy still on it? Not really, right? 
So I think it's just these two, yeah? So if so, then the answer would be Stephen Chesterfield and Jeremiah Lewis, S-C-J-L. And Tina says, I think Tammy is still on it. Maybe she is. Uh, let me save this. We were told in one of these that early on that, I think it was, She says, one of the two original suspects is no longer alive. Okay, so Tammy Gibbs is an original suspect. Okay, so she is still in it. Okay, so then we have three suspects. It starts with Stephen Chesterfield, SC. Then comes Tammy Gibbs. And then comes Jeremiah Lewis. So I have SCTGJL as the answer to the person of interest list. So I think that's going to be the right answer. And then that will help us unlock an envelope, I suspect. Let's give it a try. If we're wrong, then there's someone else that I'm forgetting. All right, persons of interest. It says, first and last initials only, in alphabetical order by last name. So I think, and then the answer is S C T -E G J L. Let's see if that's right. That's right. Okay, well done, team. Through combined efforts, you narrow your persons of interest list to three names, Stephen Chesterfield, Tammy Gibbs, and Jeremiah Lewis. Now that Mary, Lou's, Mary Louise Ennis trusts you even more, she decides to share additional information with you. After a few years of coming up empty on my investigation, I decided to take more drastic action. I joined the police academy. I thought improving my skills might help in the search for my sister. After graduating from the academy, I applied for an opening at the VFPD and was hired. So not only is one of the missing people my older sister, but I also work for the local police department. Your buddy, Bill Herbert, is my boss. In fact, I volunteered to come to the event tonight to check on things for the investigation. He doesn't know Carly's my sister, though. Let's keep that between us for now, please. In the last six months of being back in Valley Falls, I've gathered and typed up some information for the case. Maybe it will help you with your end of the investigation. You may now open envelope one. All right, so we finished with that information. And now we're getting envelope one. That was pretty satisfying. Let us see if we can avoid damaging this too much. Okay. All right, so Mary Louise Ennis is giving us the evidence she has found. Let's see what she's got for us. An earth stash sticker. Oh no, a little card. Initials only of the POI remaining plus the earth stash combination. Okay, so when we get ourselves down to the only POI remaining, and the earth stash combination, we would answer this. Beware the boogeyman. Allison Isabella Rayford, Lisa Sophia Oher, Ella Bailey Miller, Glenda Olivia Franklin, Evelyn Rose Ennis, Nadine Nash Anderson, 
Dina Flores Rodriguez. What? What are these? People that are upcoming on his list? We're, we're going to be told where this is from. But, uh, another Ennis? That's weird. It's spelled differently, though. Okay, we don't know what this is yet. Put it aside. Got a typewritten letter. Read that in a second. We've got a USB stick. Scan to access file. So, what does this say here? Found online, the posting social media account was deleted after 24 hours. So someone posted this on uh, some social media and then deleted their account. But as evidence, it's been captured. We would scan this to access it. Okay. Do not open until instructed. This looks like maybe someone's phone or something. This says, believe the legend, promote the legend, uphold the legend. The Lunar Legion, acolytes of the Blue Moon Boogeyman. Gray is the mask and brown are the clothes, a blade in the hand and boots over toes. In the darkness he comes and goes to feed his appetite. If he sees me when I'm out, I hope my life he will allow. I'll take a knee and head I'll bow under the blue moon bright. Belief is what I have today. Promote is what I have to say. Uphold the legend every day. His presence owns the night. The Lunar Legion, their acolytes of the blue moon boogeyman. The next blue moon is on August 31st. For those of you planning to attend the Boogeyman Bash, be sure to connect with other members of the Lunar Legion. Your identification word can be found in the following. Moon calendar. Creepy. I wonder if this means we're going to find words that they say in their interviews revealing that they're acolytes and then look at this that's creepy the mask you're meant to cut out so you can wear it that's creepy boogeyman bash sponsored by druid magic Reach out to us for your cleaning needs. Currently redeeming any promo code ever in use. That's creepy. And Tina says these could be months. Yes, I think you're right. J1 is January, April, the fourth month. July the 7th month, October, August the 8th month, May the 5th month, December, February, May the 5th month, this is June, J6, September, December. So if it's a unique letter of a month, they just use the letter. If it's an ambiguous letter like A, because it could be April or August, then they use a number. So January, April. Okay, so given the months, we have months, and then 621, 613, 623, 17. Well, here we have months. So January 6, 15, 21, 28. So January, so one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So each entry. Each entry with a month maps to one number in the comma. So January maps to this sixth. 
April matches to, no, that's not right. So it's the dash, the dashes, right? So 621 matches to January. April matches 613.20, and then July matches 317. Same thing here, O, A, A, M, 5, D. Two sets here, three sets here, okay. So for January, we've got 621. So if we look at January, and we combine the 6 and the 21, what do we get? How do we read this? I see. Look down at the bottom. New moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. New moon, first quarter, full moon, third quarter. So January. Let's try looking at one that's longer. How about this one? We've got four numbers here. 1, 8, 16, 24. That's for August. 1, 8, 16, 24 for August. 1, 8, 16, 24. Well, I mean, hmm, the numbers go up. Is there any number that's above 26? None of these numbers are above 26, so we could be looking at letters of the alphabet. Well, it's hard to make sense out of that. Uh, the channel probably has figured it out. No, the channel hasn't quite figured it out yet. That's good. I'm sure we will. Um, planning to attend, be sure to connect with other members of the lunar region. Your identification word can be found in the following. Your identification word can be found in the following. Huh. Well, maybe which circles we have connect them to make letters. I don't know how to make sense of that, but let's put it aside for now, since we don't have to do this yet. Promo code. Okay, we don't have any promo code. We don't have access to that. But well, we haven't read this, so let's read it. Let's see what we got here. The officer who found Catherine Highland described the scene as a bloodbath. He said Halloween candy was scattered everywhere and the remnants of balloons covered in the victim's blood were discovered. There was also an opened earth stash lockbox nearby with more candy. Since it was Halloween, I guess the candy was Catherine's contribution to the Earth Stash box. Word got out that a note was found in Catherine's mouth that said, Beware the Boogeyman. But it turns out that's not all it said. A list of seven names accompanied that warning. Maybe those seven women were being warned to look out for the killer. I managed to get a copy of the note. 
However, the names on the list don't exist in Valley Falls. I was unable to uncover anything about any of them. Hmm. So these are fake names. We take the first letters, we get A, I, R, Air, but then it falls apart. L, S, O, E, B, M, G, O, F, E, R, E. They're all three word names, I'll note. That's very suspicious. If you go down, you get A L E G E N D I S B O R N F E O R N Horn F O M F E A R Fear. Okay, look. I see born, B-O-R-N, and then F-E-A-R, fear. Born, O-M, fear, that doesn't seem right. L-E-G-E-N-D. Legend, legend, a legend is born. And then this one, uh, from fear. A legend is born from fear. Okay. All right. A legend is born. Okay, so the chat will have to tell me, did someone else, I, I know someone else wrote the full phrase before I got, but did I figure out first that we were reading these down and that these were words? I'd like to take credit from that if I was the first person who figured that. Okay, a legend is born from fear. This note was in her mouth. All right, let's keep reading here. Dennis Chesterfield is dead. I found its final resting place when I was snooping around on the family's land. It helped solidify his elimination as a person of interest. I found it funny that the epitaph read, Loving husband and father of two. He was having an affair, and rumor has it, gave up his second child by his wife for adoption at birth. So, who was Dennis Chesterfield's illegitimate wife or child and child. Is this going to turn out to be the magic shop guy? I talked with the officer on duty that took the call about the murder of Polly Lancaster. Even though it's been over 10 years since that event, it concerned me deeply that the officer couldn't remember much. I asked if he was certain that it was Tammy Gibbs that called. His exact words to me were, pretty certain, Tammy, Timmy, Tommy, Potato, Potato, Tomato, Tomato, does it really matter? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. A woman was dead. It mattered a lot. Hmm. Remember that Tammy Gibbs says she never called. So is it... Did someone else call with this name? With a name that sounded like Tammy Gibbs. Tommy, Timmy, hmm. 
I wish Daniel's girlfriend, Elizabeth Turner, we now find out the name of the, the girlfriend, could give the officers more information about the attack and the abduction. However, the poor girl feels terrible about not being able to warn Daniel about the attacker. She's mute and was behind Daniel when she saw the attacker. After she communicated a few pieces of information to the officers, the grief and shock took over and she completely shut down. She's mute. Is she the killer? Is that why she's cutting out people's uh, throats? Blue Moon Boogeyman legend is so much larger than what I anticipated. I found out there's a group of VFU obsessed with the legend. They called themselves the Lunar Legion. A contact of mine was able to get their hands on a document from their last meeting. It's very interesting. If I can figure out the identification word, so we're looking for one word, then I may be able to make contact with someone from the Lunar Legion at the Boogeyman Bash. So I need to figure out the identification word and the first name of the Lunar Legion member. Okay, so let's just go over what I think it means we're going to get. I think it means this gives us a word, probably a one, two, three, four letter word. So this whole thing is probably just going to give us one letter. This is my guess. A four letter word. And then what we're going to do is one of these people we're going to catch using that odd word. And it's probably going to be Kristen. <laughs> but it could also be Dylan. And when we catch them using that word, we will know who the Lunar Legion member is. That's my guess, which is pretty cool. And then now that we know that, maybe if we look at these symbols, we will be able to form them into letters. But let's put that aside for now still. All right, we know what this means. A legend is born from fear. Initials of the only POI remaining and the earth stash combination. All right, we don't have that. We don't have the earth stash combination. But maybe we should look at this first before we try to solve that code word. Promo code. <laughs> All right, let's do this, yeah? The other woman might be the one he said was special to her. What was the part about a woman being special to someone? I don't remember that. Let's do this, though. I think I already removed this protection, but... Uh, yeah. Let's take a look at this USB file. Mm -hmm. okay, let's see if we can listen to this together. So someone posted this on a social media site. I don't hear it. Hold on. Okay, let's try it now. Second, he hunts. If he comes for you, better duck and run with a blade in hand and the sky aglow. He will find you out 
as his hunger grows for the night you're his you may never go home the blue moon boogeyman where do you roam Okay, so clearly there were some adverts for Druid Magic in there. All right, and Tina's talking about the one with white hair that told us that he died. Okay, I don't know what any, where any of that is. That's not ringing a bell, so you got to give me more. But let's see if we can't look at the subliminal ads in this video, though. can see this is going to be a bit for the best deals and the best service round this is the druid magic advertisement remember it says he'll he'll honor discount codes so we're looking for discount codes in this video for the night you're his you may never go i wish i had the key key that would I wish I knew what key would let me advance this by frame let's just jump to the end and see if it has the code oh boy where do you roll guys don't make me do this So if we're on a desktop, we could probably do this a little easier. But, uh, oh, guys, this isn't fun. Okay, let's do it again. This isn't fun. I mean, I, I get that it's atmospheric, but uh, it's not fun to do on this device for sure. None of the keyboard hotkey works with this. Maybe if we go to this way. Really, guys? Come on. This is not right. I can't wait for 10 seconds each time I move it. It's not right. Come on, that's not right. And I don't want to have to hear this every time. Oh, I'm not enjoying this. All right, let's try to catch the timestamps. For the night you're his. 42. Highly recommend it, Camp Echo. 
I don't want to have to listen to this again. The blue moon boogeyman. Where do All right, Jonathan found the code, but can you tell me where the timestamp? No, so that the rest of us can see it. Is it at the end? Is it at the beginning? Oh boy. I have to say, like, that I'm one of these people that does not like phones and tablets, and this is why. It's like everything is a step backwards. It's in the middle, says Jonathan. Everything is a step backwards for phones and tablets. Less control, less options, more stupid things don't work. Okay, that's the other way you can tell when I start getting frustrated when it's 85 degrees in here. All right, well, Jonathan found the promo code in this advertisement. It says fresh somewhere in here. It would be easy if I could advance. Nicholas says the second subliminal message also said come see me at the home and garden expo in cape anna on march 29th to april 2nd 2018. is that going to be an alibi yeah because our Disappearance is March 31st. So if Nicola is right that the message said, Come see me in Cape Anna, that's an alibi for our magic guy. Which makes sense. He was too easy, wasn't he? All right, the promo code's in the third subliminal message, but unfortunately that doesn't help me find it. I, it's, I, I changed the position, then we gotta wait five seconds to find out if that's where the message is. That's ridiculous. All right, maybe it's... Uh, you know, it's YouTube on the tablet. Not fun, guys. Not fun. Not fun. All right. Well, maybe if we could move around by frame, but we can't. So, I don't know. I'll try to do better with this YouTube playback, but I really blame the tablets. All right, well, we know what the code is. So he's got an alibi and we have the code is fresh. All right, so. Okay, it doesn't matter. Let's not worry about it. Um. All right, so it's sponsored by Druid Magic. Reach out for your cleaning needs, currently redeeming any promo codes ever in use. All right, so let's put in our promo code fresh. If you're watching the stream, maybe you can pause it yourself, but I cannot. So maybe on my little to-do list for myself. And so what playing YouTube on the tablet is really a pain. It doesn't full size properly. Okay, so I'm gonna try to get frame it. It's not the first time we've needed to frame advance on a playing back, but the problem here wasn't even that I couldn't frame advance. The problem was that it took five seconds every time I moved to a different frame. 
So it would take us forever to try to find it. Okay. Well, here we go. On YouTube desktop, the period and the comma are the shortcuts. All right, let's see if that. Let's see if that works here. Period and comma, huh? Period and comma don't do anything on period and comma don't do anything on this tablet version of Chrome at least. It's just terrible. Terrible. All right. Mask unlock. All right. So we think the code here is fresh based on what the channel says you saw in the subliminal message. All right, deep breath, Jesse. Relax. You call Druid Magic and the owner, Jeremiah Lewis, picks up the phone. You provide the promo code that you found in his video ad from many years ago. Immediately, you hear him gasp on the other end of the phone. <gasps> well, I wasn't prepared to hear that today. It's been a long time since anyone has mentioned that code to me. You're one of only a handful of people who have used it. You should know that ad wasn't one of my finest moments. I was young and money hungry at the time. I thought playing on the popularity of the boogeyman legend would be a good thing for my business. Within 24 hours, however, I started seeing my fair share of negative comments as a result of the ad, and I deleted the entire thing. Perhaps it was wrong of me to use real-life tragedy to build my business. And yes, before you point out the obvious, I did sponsor the event. Leonard asked me to, and I thought it might be a good chance for redemption. I thought my money could be spent bringing more awareness to the situation and might even help find the missing victims. Knowing that Earthstash has been hijacked for an evil agenda here troubles me. I guess it's not much different than what I've done. However, if you find yourself looking for a pure form of entertainment, I suggest you try it. The key to your enjoyment is Earth. Earth Stash has been hijacked. The key to your enjoyment is Earth. What does that mean? The key to your enjoyment. So, is that, that's the key. We were told the way you decode the messages is to use a keyword. So he's telling us the keyword is E-A-R-T-H. So we're going to need that later when we find the key stat, the the earth stash combination right he's talking about this process the middle section is a cipher that requires a keyword so when we find this we now know the keyword but we still don't know how to get into here all right, so we use the USB, which was painful. We know what this is. We know what this scary mask is. We know that Jeremiah, who looked like a good suspect at one point, was really just running an ad campaign. We aren't, this is going to be the key stash. We're not told to open this yet, though. And we don't know the identification word and the first name of the Lunar Legion member. So that's going to be our puzzle. It's time for us to solve this to get a word which tells us 
one of these people said that word, then we're going to have their name and the word, and we'll be able to open up this or get into this. All right, but it's time for a break. I apologize for getting frustrated at that YouTube page. I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back. We're trying to solve this puzzle. Now, it's sort of breaking the rules for me to be looking at this during break, but I did notice something. I suspect we're going to get one word here. So I think we're going to get a four-letter word. Three, four. So this is going to be a letter. So I looked at this for a second. We think this is January, April, and July. And I noticed... January, April, and July are right stacked on top of each other. That seems like a huge clue. So if we do the little trick here, actually this is going to be harder to do because it's... So if we look here, we've got January... So let me see if I can get a little better. January 6 and 21. So let's just put this here. Do it like this. So January 6, 21. I don't think it has anything to do with the symbols. I think it's just going to draw a shape when we do it. So 6, 21. Then April 6, 13, and 20. 6. 13, 20, and then July 3 and 17. So July 3 and 17, and you can see what we've got here. We've got the letter H. So I think that's how we're going to get this word here. It's just that simple. So our first word is, first letter is H. And then the second one is October 28th. Let's do it. Move it up here. Okay. So if we do October 28th and then August 1, 8, 1624. 
one eight sixteen twenty four. That's weird. But and then May twelve and December five. So May twelve and December five. Okay, so there we have our A. That was our H. So our second letter is A. Okay, so this is clearly it. February 5 and May 5 and 12. All right, let's do that. February 5, May 5 and 12. Looks like we just have an L. H A L. And then lastly, we have June 4, 10, and 18. So June 4, 10, and 18, followed by September 6 and 22, September 6 and 22, and then December 5, 12, and 19, 5, 12, 19, that's an O. So halo is our identification word. Okay, so we figured that out. And now the idea that I had was that one of these people is going to be using that word. And Tina says it was Dylan that said that. Let's find out if that's true. Was this idea because the ads were so well, people would use the promo code without any idea where they saw it? Okay, so let's see if Dylan really is the person that mentions this word halo. The full moon reminds me of the halo I know my sister is wearing now. She was such an angel. So... Remember, the reason why we thought someone was going to be saying that is he says, this legion says, if you're planning, be sure to connect with, the, with other members by using the following word. So do we need to make sure no one else is using that word? Is there anyone else who uses the word halo? Is it just our guy? You know he says it. Let's make sure Stefan doesn't say it. Or Kristen, who I thought it was going to be Kristen. Doesn't look like it. Looks like it's only Hernan Dylan Hernandez. So we think. It's Dylan Hernandez is a member of the Lunar Legion, fans of the Boogeyman. Let's see. Uh, Daniel's parents were here for a moment. He's upset. Of, he's pretending to be upset about it. My sister was killed by a drunk driver when she was about Daniel's age. A hole inside me I've never been able to fill. I've tried everything possible. Now it's time he's pretending he's going to help others. Let's take a look at Dylan. Is there any clue in his tattoos? You see any tattoo of the boogeyman? Okay, so we think he's a lunar legion. Acolyte.
which I guess means we can answer this now. I may be able to make contact with someone from the Lunar Legion, so I need to figure out... Okay, so our girl, Mary Louise Ennis, is going to try to make contact with Dylan now that we can tell her it's Dylan. She needs the identification word and the first name, so we believe that the identification word is Halo, and the first name is Dylan. So Halo Dylan is the answer to that puzzle. Let's try that. Yeah? All right. That's the second time in this game that one of the challenges, one of the puzzles, was not an abstract puzzle, but was reading comprehension, deduction, figuring out how, where we should be looking for it. Okay, H A L O D Y L A N. Here we go. Let's save it unprotected. You discover that the Lunar Legion identification word is Halo and try to decide how to proceed. Thinking about your interactions so far at the Boogeyman Bash, you remember Dylan Hernandez mentioning his sister as having a Halo. You decide to approach Dylan again with your newly discovered identification code and gauge his reaction. As soon as you say the word halo, Dylan's demeanor immediately changes. I see you figured out the identification word, so I guess it's safe to talk to you. Putting up a front is exhausting. It's nice to meet another member of the Lunar Legion without jumping through all the hoops of wearing robes and masks. Uh, since we're kindred spirits and all, I'll let you in on a little secret. The stuff I said about my sister isn't true at all. She's alive and well. I played the sympathy card, hoping people here wouldn't pay much attention. I really just wanted to be a fly on the wall. The other stuff about self-destructive behavior, though, is a different story. I've gone through plenty of dark times, and that's where I met Tammy Gibbs. We each had our vices and sometimes found ourselves in the same circles. Law enforcement is barking up the wrong tree with her. Tammy didn't make that call, I know, because I was with her on the night of the murder of Polly Lancaster. We were on the opposite side of town looking for an earth stash box. We had zero interest in playing the game to find the box. It's what was inside that we were interested in. The box was supposed to contain a canister of nitrous oxide. That was our shared vice at the time. Someone was putting out green balloons filled with nitrous oxide at different spots around town. Tammy was the one who found out about the balloons and told me about them. Each balloon would have a ribbon tied to it with an earth stash card containing a location puzzle. Imagine giving junkies a puzzle to solve to get their fix. If the groupings of green balloons also included a single yellow balloon, one of the earth stash Locations contain the canister of nitrous oxide. Otherwise, the balloons just provided a quick hit. I talked to Tammy a few nights ago, and she gave me one of the newest Earth Stash cards. She said there was a yellow balloon present. The days of chasing a high are behind me, but maybe you can enjoy a thrill. Uh... Oh, there's our Earth Stash code and how to read it. Okay, so before we decode this, we were told about a scene of one of our murders with balloons. Do you remember that? 
Um, where did we read that? Was it in our notebook or online? I'm fairly certain we were told by some balloon about some balloon. Does anyone remember where that was? Um, I guess here, right here. The officer who found Catherine Highland described the scene as a bloodbath. He said Halloween candy was scattered everywhere. The remnants of balloons covered in the victim's blood were discovered. So remnants of balloon. Hmm. Does one of our places have balloons? One of our businesses? No. Balloons with nitrous oxide and drugs. All right, well, he's given an alibi for Tammy Gibbs. We still don't know who called in. Right? But if Tammy Gibbs is off our list, that still leaves us with. So we had three people. Tammy Gibbs has an alibi and Jeremiah Lewis had an alibi. So that just leaves Stephen Chesterfield, the own, new owner of the farm. Let's just take another look at him. Now that he's our only suspect. Let's just read what he says. He's a simple man. Faith, family, and farming are what make me happy. Tried being a suit after graduating college. Was it for me? This farm has been in my family for multiple generations. Mr. Kirkland asked me about using the barn for the event. It was my first choice. Because this is where the legend started, but he offered me 3000 to use the place money talks. Over the last decade, making a living by farming has been increasingly difficult, especially since my father was a person of interest. Taking money to keep things rolling for a little while means sacrificing my pride, so be it. Hmm. Okay. So, we solved that. <clears throat> and the combination is what we're going to get from this web page. So we only have one person of interest remaining. That's Stephen Chesterfield. But we need the combination. So this is going to be the thing we do last. So what we need to do now the only one other than that is the is the puzzle on our web page here. Let's take a look at this more seriously now. Okay. So let's see if I can put this on the screen for us here. Okay, the middle section is the cipher. That's the R J E F P H K. The group of letters above are the starting point, and the letters below are the heading. There's no encryption on these two sections, just missing letters. Okay, so if you look at that, the heading, let's do the heading at the bottom first, S-W-I-L. So, there's just missing letters. There's three missing letters that give us a heading.
And then it says towards the heading. Oh, it's going to be an, uh, these are going to be two items. So starting from, starting from G-A-T, G-A-E-T-N, which is missing five letters, we're going to head towards S-W-I-L, which is missing three letters. Starting point and heading, and then in the middle, the middle section is a cipher that requires a keyword. Above the middle letters are the starting point, no encryption. The fourth letter from the top, middle, and bottom sections will give you the combination. All right, that's a little, feels like there's a little too much stuff there, but okay, let's see. What is our starting? Like, or should we be trying to decrypt the middle thing first? So we know Earth is our keyword, E A R T H, that we're going to be putting on top. This is a cipher that we don't uh, that we don't encounter much in this game in our playthroughs, a key base cipher, like a one time pad. So I believe we would add E to R, which would give us a W, and then add A to J, which would give us a K, that doesn't seem right. And R to the E, which would give us a hmm. Okay. All right, my light isn't working anymore. It lost its connection, but I see that DJ Monicut in the channel has figured out Sawmill. So, Sawmill does make sense for the bottom word. So you're starting somewhere and then you're heading towards the sawmill. Now, why isn't this code decoding the way I expected? You're on a farm. What would our first word be? What's weird is the example R slash combination. Could we see the instructions again? Sure. The middle section is a cipher that requires a keyword. Okay, so we know the middle is a cipher that and we know the keyword is earth. So normally we would add E to the R and then 
look that up. Might it be subtracting? If we subtract an E from the R, we get M. And then if we subtract an A from a J, we get I. And if we subtract R from the E, we get N and T from the F. That's tricky. L eight from the P we get H that doesn't seem right. All right, let's back up for a second. What's weird is the instructions are strange, telling us to look in a location. So it's saying the middle is a cipher, you need a keyword. Okay, so leave aside how to solve it. Then above are the starting point. The GATN is a starting point. So if it said 7MLBX, we change that to mailbox. The number you find once arriving at the starting location represents steps taken toward the heading. This is confusing because it doesn't feel like, for example, if 20 was found on the mailbox, you would walk 20 steps. This step doesn't seem like what we have to do. We just have to find the word at the top, the word at the bottom, the word at the middle. Once we find those three words, then we look at the fourth letter from the top, middle, and bottom sections to give us a combination to the container. So sawmill, S-A-W-M, the fourth letter for the third word is M. So we only care about the fourth letter of this middle word and the fourth letter of the top word. I guess if we solve the top one, It looks like Antina has solved the top word as gravestone. G R A V E S O E R V S O E. That's our five letters missing. Okay, so gravestone. So gravestone is our top word. The fourth letter there is a V. Our third word is sawmill. The fourth letter there is an M. So we're looking for a V M. It's probably going to be an A. So now how do we get from an F to an A? One, two, three, four, five. E A R G H. How about what oh M? I guess it's not necessarily an A. Okay, so mill V, and then we have V something M. Now, why? If the keyword is earth, and this is a cipher, requires a keyword, and the keyword is earth, maybe the keyword isn't earth. 
he said earth is your key the key is earth he said that online on one of our things Oh, don't do it, guys. Don't do it. Don't do it. Looks like I did not save the... Can I not save this unpro what's happening here? The key to your enjoyment is earth. I must not have unprotected this. The key to your enjoyment is earth. He's saying try earth stash, you'll enjoy it. The key to your enjoyment is earth. So that seems fair, fairly clear that the key here is earth. Key to your enjoyment is earth. Why is there this big black circle at the top too? Hmm. E and R and M A and J gives you an I. If you find yourself looking for a pure form of entertainment, I suggest you try it. The key to your enjoyment is Earth. And Tina says, could it be you add five, add one, and add R, and so on? Well, that's exactly what I assumed it would be. That's how you use a kind of one-time pad, but that's not what's, that didn't work. That's what I tried to do. I mean, I guess I could try it again. That's exactly what I assumed it would be, and it didn't work. The key to your enjoyment is Earth. So I assumed you would just take a look at this R J E F. We only care about the first, the fourth letter, so you would write down. The way you, I would assume this would work is you'd write down R E J F T H, and then you write Earth on top of it, E A R T H, and then you keep repeating E A R T H, and then you just add these 
So e plus r is 5 plus 18 is 23. That gives you a w. a plus j gives you 11, which is a k. r, sorry, you can't see this. r plus e is 18 plus 5 is 23. This is another w. T plus F is 6 plus 20, which is a Z. <laughs> H plus P is 8 plus 16, which is 24, which is an X. When you think this should be a word, I mean, if we don't care about a word that's a Z, as the fourth letter, and then our total password would be V Z M. You want to try that? If you subtract, I tried subtracting. I got M I N L. It didn't seem right. I could keep going. Let's let's try this so that we don't waste time. If this is it, so first dash combination it could be VZM. The only PO it would be breaking the normal way that Deadbolt works. Our only POI remaining is Stephen Chesterfield, so SC. So S C V Z M. I mean, let's just try it. And and then we'll see. That shouldn't be right, but we'll see. All right. So we're going to try this rather than go crazy. And then if this works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll go back to the drawing board. Okay, so initials of the only person of interest remaining, which is Stephen Chesterfield, SC. And then we know the first letter of the code is V. And then maybe it's a Z, and then maybe and then M. Let's try this. No, doesn't like it. So that's just wrong, which is good. It shouldn't be right. This is going to mean something. Uh, it's a location as instruction for the game. Well, you guys think it should be a location, but it doesn't. That's not what it says here. Look at the instructions again. What it says is... The middle section is a cipher that requires a keyword. Oh, guys, you're really breaking my heart here. The middle section, RJEF, is a cipher that requires a keyword. That's all it says about the middle section. That's it. Doesn't say it's a location, a number, nothing. All it says about the middle section is it's a cipher that requires a keyword. And then there's a lot of, there's some silly stuff here. Step three is really just confusing because all it says is important is that the upper section and the lower section, it says the lower section is a heading. You might think that's angle, but that's not right. The example they give is that the upper section is something mailbox, and then the lower section says if it was towards the house, then that's what you would do. So it seems clear that what it's saying is it's given some ridiculous instructions that are not relevant for us. If you look at step four, this is the only thing we care about. The fourth letter from the top, middle, and bottom sections will give you the combination to the container. 
So we don't need to figure this stuff out about going 20 steps from A to B or the heading. All we need to know is we've already found the box for all it cares. So all we need to know is the combination. The combination has to be the fourth letter in the top word, the fourth letter in the middle word, and then the fourth letter in the bottom word. We know the top and bottom words, gravestone, G-R-A-V, so V is the fourth letter in the top word. We know the bottom word is sawmill, so M. So we know the first letter is a V, the last letter is an M. We just need to know the fourth letter in this middle cipher. But you would expect when we decode that middle thing for it to actually be a word. It's a cipher. It requires a keyword. Is it possible that it's not earth, but it's stash? I don't think so. So R J E F T H. How do we affect that? With S T A S H. R plus H is thirty seven. That would be a K. T plus J is 30, that would be a D, that's not going to be right. It's a cipher that requires a keyword, and we're told that you should try Earthstash. The key to your enjoyment, let's just take a look at this, your enjoyment. How many letters are in your enjoyment? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen letters in your enjoyment. And how many letters in that bottom thing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's unfortunate. But what if it's to your enjoyment? The key to, to your enjoyment is 15 letters. The key to your enjoyment is earth. To your enjoyment. But Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So the phrase to your enjoyment is fifteen letters, which is what Jonathan was saying, which is what that ma matches up to. So if that was the case, R, J, E, F, T, e, H, K, M, and then I'm going to write on top of it, T, O, Y, O, U, 
R E N to your enjoyment. So is that working? Is that actually working? Let's see. So I've written to your enjoyment on top of these, and now I'm subtracting. T minus R is two, that's a B. O minus J is five, that's an E. Y minus E is 20, which is a T. O minus F, 15 minus 6 is 9, that's an I. U minus P is 21 minus 6 is a 5, that's an E. R minus H is 10, which is a J. E minus K is the first time we don't see anything. Oh, and you're not even looking at it. Let's kill me. Because of these. Okay. All right, so that didn't seem right. What if we add? P plus R gives 38, which is an L. O plus J is 15 plus 10 is 25 which gives us a y y plus e is 25 plus 5 is 30 which is a d o plus f is 15 plus 6 is 21 which is a u u plus p is 21 37, which is a K. This is not right. It also doesn't make sense because you can come up with, you can, you can, oh, guys, come on. You can come up with the reasons why you're trying to use the phrase to your enjoyment, but you still got to find there. Obviously earth is. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, there are some online, there are some online websites that will let us put in a key and a phrase. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely malfunctioning in terms of using a keyword and a cipher.
Is it possible we're supposed to be? Is it possible that it's based on the difference between Earth and Stash? So R J E F T H A Earth and Stash is plus fourteen. That doesn't work. I mean, works. We have to cycle around. No, it's too painful. And Tina says, do we have other puzzles available? Jonathan says, are we failing to connect Earth back to something else? Uh, no, this is it. This is our puzzle. This is our last puzzle. Let's just see. There's something I'm missing. R J E F T H K. I'm saying the keyword is Earth. Claire. Okay, so that looks like that's going to be it. Now I don't understand why. What? Why was I not doing it right? That's very M L S N J E R H. Well, this is embarrassing because I believed I was doing this manually, but obviously I wasn't. So we're going to let this thing tell us. H, and then we're going to figure out what on earth Claremont Place. Okay, so Claremont Place, and the fourth letter of that is an I. So it was just the keyword was earth. 
VIM is going to be the code. But now, why, what is this doing that I wasn't doing manually? I don't understand. Eat Caesar cipher, variant of the Caesar cipher. Instead of having all letters in alphabetical order, it starts with the code word. Earth. Unused letters are then added after the code word. If the code word is blank, it, it behaves exactly like an ordinary Caesar cipher. No, don't get it. Is it not that we're adding E A R T H? Oh, you're saying you're saying we write out P A R T H, and then we add the rest of the letters in the alphabet. There's already an A, so we add a B, a C, a D. There's already an E, an F, G. There's already an H. I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, e, and so on. And then under these we go E, B, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. E. And then when we look at our message, But I haven't written it out. R S T. So you're saying R goes to C. Where's our rest of our message? R goes to C. J goes to L. E goes to A. F goes to I, and we get Claire. Claremont place. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess I have seen a cipher like that. It's just that's not what I assumed it would be. Okay. That isn't that it, there. It's not a totally made up cipher type, but uh, it was just not what well, we've never encountered that before. I assumed we were just going to be adding the key words on top. Okay, well, <laughs> online tool to the rescue. So, doesn't matter. We've got our three letters that make up our key. V, I, M. Now we can put it in, but before we do, deep breath, <laughs> let's uh, take a break, come back in eight minutes. I think probably, maybe we'll be able to solve it in our next session. I'll see you in eight minutes.
Okay, we're back. Little bumpy ride in the middle there, but uh, teamwork is bringing us through. I did want to take a moment to bring out Martin Gardner's classic. Clearly, I need to go back and do some remedial reading of this. So here's Martin Gardner on what he calls a keyword cipher. And here we 
here he is explaining the exact cipher we just encountered. A substitution cipher, that's what I would call that, a substitution cipher using a keyword. If it had given us a little bit more information that it was a substitution cipher with a keyword. So here he is explaining, you write the keyword first, then you write all the letters not found in the keyword and alphabetically, and that gives you the substitution translations. No mention of the history of that. Who invented it? Too bad. I'd like to know. All right. So. Let's put it in. Let's see if we can open up this box and see what's going on. One interesting thing, though, is we don't really understand why we still don't understand why there's a disappearance and a murder their larynx is cut out we know that there's a someone told us about another child that the father had illegitimately is this guy doing this just to make money on the make the farm famous we don't know but let's try to scan this and get more evidence. All right, so it says, yes, download it again. Okay, the initials of the only person of interest, that's SC for Stephen Chesterfield, and VIM is our password unless I'm misunderstanding something. Here we go. All right, I am looking forward to reading this. Feeling accomplished by solving your first Earth's Dash puzzle, you and Mary Louise Ennis ditch the event and go to Claremont Place. Walking on the shoulder of the road, you look for the gravestone and find one. The number 52 is scratched into its back. Seeing the sawmill in the distance, you walk 52 steps toward it. You don't have to look hard to see where the ground was recently disturbed. Should we be opening this? This is how people get killed. With both hands, you and Mary Louise pull the dirt back and eventually uncover a round container with a three-letter combination lock. Using VIM as the combination, the lock pops open. Lifting the lid of the container, you find a small piece of folded black paper. You may now open the black paper. I'm a little scared to open this, to be 100% honest here. Um, really? I'm a little nervous about this. To be honest, like, I don't want to get killed by that person coming in through the door. All right, here we go. Appointment reminder for account information, dial a clean smile followed by the access code access code patient initials numbers only no spaces the scorpion was here okay so remember the way these stashes work once you find one you leave something in it so this is clearly left by our last person that went missing, remember we're told he was known as the Scorpion. So, so 
So we're going to scan this in and put in his initials. And his initials is Daniel Shoemaker. So DS, numbers only, no spaces. What does that mean? So Daniel Shoemaker, the scorpion, left this. For account information, dial a clean smile, followed by the access code. And the access code is patient initials. Numbers only. Um, I wish Daniel's girlfriend, Elizabeth Turner, could give the officers more information. She feels terrible. She's mute. She was behind Daniel when she saw the attacker. Well, I think you're right. I think Antina's right. So, what Antina says in the channel, just to sum it up more briefly, is that this thing about dial is trying to get us to think about how letters are turned into numbers. So, letters are turned into numbers on a telephone dial. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. I don't know why it's that way, but okay. So if we, if his initials are DS, then the question is, assuming it's just DS, then what we're asked what we need to ask ourselves is what's the two digits for d and s so someone could look that up but i guess i can just type it in So DS would be three seven. Unless we use his middle initial. Which is Scorpion. So that would be three seven seven. And Tina says, I think it's the whole phrase. So dial that number. I see what you're saying. You're saying dial this whole number followed by the access code and the access code is the patient's initials. I would prefer if this wasn't like, this seems like it's separated. Like this is this, this is this. It would make sense if this was over here, but I guess this is supposed to be the opposite side of that. It just would have been better to just have this in as a card in here, but okay. So a clean smile. You think we have to do this whole thing?
All right, let's, let's do it. A clean smile is two, two, and L is a five, E is a three, A is a two, N is a six, S is a seven, M is a six, I is a four, L is a five, E is a three, and then three, seven for D, S. So there's our full code. A C L E A N S M I L E D S. All right, let's try it. I think that's right. I think you got it right. Let's try it. All right, so we think the code is two, two, five, three, two, six, seven, six, four, five, three, three, seven. All right, well, that was nice that we only had to do it once. Wasn't surprised. Okay, good work, team. As you complete the call, an automated voice comes on the line. Thank you for calling the Flossing Druid. Your upcoming appointment is August 31st at 9.30 a.m. You will see Tommy Gibbs, DMD, for your regular checkup. We look forward to seeing you for your appointment at the Flossing Druid on Abbey Lane, where a clean smile is the best smile. Not sure why Abbey Lane is blue. But you obviously see what I see, right? What's important here? But uh, something must have gone wrong with... There must be a puzzle we haven't... Oh, I see. Tommy is similar to Tammy. That's exactly right. This is the person who was a witness. Not Tammy Gibbs, but Tommy Gibbs. So Tommy Gibbs, the dentist, is going to have been the witness who called in. Now, you might ask, well, there's no more puzzles. What do we do? And we notice, why is Abbey Lane blue? Well, now we know, because look at the final envelope. Where do you go? This is our envelope too. So obviously this is our Abbey Lane. So let us scan in this envelope and put in, oops, you didn't see that. Sorry about that. Okay, so Abby Lane. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got. You get to the Flossing Druid Dental Clinic and see Stephen Chesterfield closing the back door to the basement. You're shocked to see him here. He drives off and you decide to go in and explore. You find a deep freezer that's very intriguing because it has been modified with a combination lock. You've never seen a lock on a freezer before, only in the horror movies or in the true crime movies. Multiple metallic nitrous oxide canisters reflect the light from the fluorescent fixtures overhead. So is this guy giving the nitrous oxide out to lure people? 
you see a wooden box with the chain and combination lock in the corner. So we've got deep freezers that are locked, nitrous oxide, and a wooden box with a chain and a lock. This is at the basement to the flossing druid where our witness works. And yet Stephen Chesterfield is there. That's weird. All right. Given that your only remaining person of interest was just here in a place with so many unordinary findings in the basement, you feel like you're on the right track. You may now open envelope two. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, want, I can't wait to see how this story ends. Normally, the last envelope would be the solution, but it seems like maybe it's not for us. Maybe there's a little bit more. All right. Let's clear our workspace here. So we actually have a solution pamphlet. When we know how to answer that puzzle. And here is the freezer lock and the... and the wooden box lock. So let's take a closer look. At the freezer, we see R.I.P. Dad. So it looks like it's his year of birth, year of death of the father. Where did we learn that information? I think it might have been on one of our online sites. All right, so we know it's the son, it's going to be the son. So was the dentist the other son? So I think that's that. And then if we look at the wooden box, is it letters? It's letters. And we know a fear, a legend is born in fear, was the decoding of this message. A legend is born in fear. So, This looks like we're supposed to give, let's see, is there something on the back of this? No caps, no spaces. I mean, I'm not sure if this should be born or fear. Okay, so Antina is reminding us that the, here's the code for that one. Numbers only, okay. So if we look at this one, Antina says, the place where we learned about the father's death was with the old, with the woman. That was very early on. So let's see if we can't find that. Uh, oh, I see. It's not going to be. Oh, boy, this could be painful. Uh, it won't let me scroll that. How about if I go this way? Okay. So it was... Not the merchandise booth. Oh, boy.
Okay, good. We found her. Okay, let's see. Does she have a date of the father's death? October 23rd, 2012 holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to myself. No, this wasn't it. This wasn't where we heard about the father dying. Where did we hear about the father dying? <laughs> Was it an online thing? Okay, I have to slow down or I'm going to get frustrated. <laughs> Dennis Chesterfield is dead. I found his resting place when I was snooping around the family's land. It helped solidify his elimination as a person of interest, loving husband and father of two. He was having an affair. Rumor has it he gave up his second child by his wife for adoption at birth. Second child by his wife. Where's Ari? There's Dennis Chesterfield. It may be that we don't know his death. I thought we knew. I thought we encountered it at some point. Let me look at this for a second. 1593. All right, so obviously we need both dates. Uh, and Tina says, I think if the woman with her white hair had her secret date, I mean, she did, yes, she did have a 
special date that she doesn't want to tell us about. I agree that that sounds... First of all, this is ridiculous that we're going to have to search through these and we can't, we don't know which is which, but okay. It is true that she has a date, October 23, 2012, holds a special place. But, uh, well, I guess you could say that instead of wanting, I thought it would be his, when you say RIP to someone, normally you say, like, here's the year they were born, four digits, and the year they died, four digits. But I guess an alternative would be you could have this whole date, 10-23-2012. Could be when the father died. But... I guess that's compatible. Mm, is it? 2012 is when the body is found and the father is still alive. So he would have had to die at the end of this year that this was recorded, that this interview took place. So I don't know. I mean, we could try it. But let's try doing the what the other one first. I agree with that. Maybe there'll be clues in here. Okay, so legend equals question mark. So we know that the thing said a legend is born in fear. So you think it's fear rather than born, huh? Born in fear. A legend is born in fear. I mean, we can try fear here, and if it works, it works. If born in fear don't work, then it's something more subtle about born in fear. But let's try doing it. A legend is born in fear. So maybe we're looking at, I guess fear is more likely, like there's in the boxes fear. I'm typing F-E-A-R. Let's see if that's it. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Once you have determined what equals legend, you put fear into the tumblers of the combination lock. The lock pops open and you pull the chain off the box. As you lift the box lid, you see a collection of jars. On closer examination, you see that each jar contains some sort of flesh-colored tissue housed in a murky liquid. You think back to the specifics of the boogeyman case running through the details to determine that the jar, what the jars might contain. You gasp as you realize that you are looking at someone's vocal cords. After a health scare many years ago, you gave up smoking, but not before watching your fair share of videos about the dangers of smoking and how it could lead to inflammation of the vocal cords. What's in the jar looks a lot like what you saw in those videos. It appears you have found the Blue Moon Boogeyman's trophy collection. That's it. Okay. Is it possible that the, let's see, the Flossing Druid has no dates on its logo, so it's not that. All right, well, we just found his trophy location, but no additional clues. The chat says, let's try the October date on the freezer lock. I mean, I'm willing to try it. I'm willing to try it. So, oh boy. 
So I gotta say, I didn't save it. So let me remember to save it. God help you if you don't have a system that removes the security. Okay, so the woman says, October 23rd, 2012 holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to myself. I'm not going to love this if this is if this is right. But we'll see. I'm not going to love it though. I don't disagree that it is interesting clue, but I'm not going to love if we're just putting in the only date that we have. So, 10-23-2012. Here we go. Well, that was it. You think back to information that Catherine Coburn provided you with, namely the date of October 23rd, 2012, for Dennis Chesterfield. You're confused about why the freezer would say R.I.P. Dad. Of course, you saw Stephen Chesterfield leaving the premises as you arrived, so there's a definite connection. Not knowing how else to interpret what you've learned, you use the date as the combination and hear the freezer latch disengage. You did not expect what happens next. Cold air billows out as you lift the freezer lid, and there, looking back at you, is the frozen, lifeless body of Daniel Shoemaker. Wait. Okay. So that's it. So this says frozen, right? And the other one said vocal cords. So I think now... We're just meant to answer the solution. Freezer plus box. So I guess frozen vocal cords is what it wants here. Do we want to talk about what we think has happened here? The woman is the one he had an affair with. Or he didn't have an affair, actually. We got that wrong. It said he gave up his second child for adoption. And Tina says, talk quickly before the dentist gets us. So do we think the dentist is going to be the second kid? But Tommy Gibbs, we think he called in. Let me just look at what the caller said. Uh... Oh, it wasn't there. It was on the first case. Ten second call from a person who said their name was Tammy Gibbs. Da, 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 da. Talking caller was hysterical, talking fast. Tommy was driving by a farm when a masked monster attacked a lady on a bicycle. She mentioned something about a druid, too. Hmm. I don't think I really understand the case, but maybe we're going to get it explained to us here. All right. Let's do this. Uh, 
we're gonna say frozen vocal chords. Shocked by the horrors you have uncovered, Mary Louise calls Phil and tells him what you've found. He sends VFPD officers immediately to the scene. As she hangs up the phone, the basement door opens and you find yourself looking at Stephen Chesterfield. Then the light shifts a little and you realize it isn't Stephen, but someone who looks so much like him, it's uncanny. The look of surprise on the man's face makes it clear he wasn't planning on having visitors tonight. He's dressed in flip-flops, shorts, and a medical scrub top with Tommy Gibbs DMD embroidered on the chest pocket. The man lunges down the stairs towards you. However, in his haste, he's failed to see Mary Louise. When he reaches the bottom of the stairs, she catches him in the jaw with a solid right hook, instantly knocking him out. The sirens and blue lights arrive within minutes. You may now open the solution. So did he call in... He surely wouldn't have called in a fake witness report and given his real name, would he? So strange. John says, could the first murder have been by the father had something to do with the drug deal gone wrong made it look more gruesome to cover it up then the father died and the son started to kill but as a real serial killer the father was dead by then in fear a legend is born so is it is it possible that Tommy Gibbs, when he made this call, wasn't the first killer? But he saw and actually made an honest call in. Is our first murder victim... We know the same killer is responsible for the missing people and the stabbed people. We don't know why he's missing some and stabbing others, but it seems like the same person. Or is it the two brothers each have a locker? That's what it is. No, it's the two brothers. Look at this. Each of the brothers has a locked box where they keep their trophies. Like the dentist guy killer, that brother, has the vocal cords. He's the one who's killing the, the people. And then the other son is the one doing the missing people? Seems like I'm on the wrong trail, according to the channel, though. The channel is all about father. The father was the first killer. Maybe the father created the serial killers of the two sons. I think each of the sons has one of these boxes. All right, we can now open the solution. Oh, do you want to discuss it some more? Let's hear. Let's hear your theories. I guess we should. We shouldn't. We shouldn't rush. We should take a moment to discuss the case and see if we can figure it out. I mean, the dentist is coming down the stairs. He's trying to kill us. He's obviously the one responsible for like the vocal cords and stuff. The question is, why would he have been the original witness? Why would he have called in? 
So or we're thinking he isn't the first killer. But you're right, the first victim that this guy called in on did have her vocal cords removed. So... Unless he really was trying to call in a for false witness report, It seems weird, though. So we know Stephen Chesterfield and his brother. We know they must be doing this together because we just saw Stephen Chesterfield leave this place. So they're, they've got to be working together. And the fact that that date of the woman opened the thing, opened the freezer, We think that she's the mother of the dentist. And that date was the date she got her son back because the father died. That's so strange. Let's see what the chat says. I think the father removed the vocal cords, try and cover up the first murder, make it look more sinister than just a drug deal gone wrong. Did we learn anything from the short? Film. Either way, I think Tommy saw someone getting murdered and her drug deal gone wrong, but Tommy didn't understand why. Later, their brother and father came to clean and recruited. Uh, can someone remind me about where you're getting the drug ring stuff from? I don't remember any drug ring. Can someone refresh me on that? Where did we learn about some drug ring, some big drug deal and murder during a drug deal? Like you got the nitrous oxide being left in the geocache. First of all, people don't do drug deals for nitrous oxide. That's a, and this, these people are setting it out there for like fun. I mean, nitrous oxide is not a big illegal drug trade operation. There's no Mexican cartel drug deals for nitrous oxide. I think it makes more sense to say that the dentist was using the nitrous oxide balloons to lure in people to kill them. And maybe huffing it like a David Lynch film. But that's not a drug deal cover-up murder. I mean, I think the dentist is just using nitrous oxide to lure people to kill them. And maybe he's huffing it, which makes him go slightly crazy, but uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the father.
Um, the only question is, is, are the brothers working together? And I think the brothers are working together. I think one of them is stabbing people and taking their vocal cords, and one is just capturing people. But it's possible that Stephen doesn't know about the murders and is just talking to his brother. Or just went for an appointment. I still don't understand what this woman, why her favorite date is when the dad... And Tina says, I don't think they work together. Okay, let's say it's only the one, then, if th that's a possibility. It's only the dentist guy. He's the murderer. He's always been the murderer. And... I don't suppose there's anything more to explain. All right, well, get be get get yourself official. Everyone, go on the record whether you think that the dentist guy is working alone or with his brother, or whether you think the father committed the first murder. I think it's always been the... I'm going to say that the brothers are working together. They're both serial killers. How old do we think they were in 2012? Well, think of it this way. Here's, here's how he is in 2023. So how old does that guy look there? Maybe... Early 30s? 30s? So, he's in 20s? Let's look at this. He's already moved on. He tried working after he graduated college. It didn't work. So, he would have been at least 18 or so during the first murders, which happened in 2012, a decade ago. So he only has to be old enough a decade ago. Jonathan says, wait, could the person who made the phone call have been saying Tommy is the killer, but the cop bungled it so badly if someone was saying their name and they were Tammy? That's an interesting idea. Said their name was Tammy Gibbs. The call is filled with static. The caller was hysterical, talking extremely fast. That's an interesting theory, Jonathan. You're saying that we don't have to come up with an explanation for why Tammy Gibbs called. Because your interpretation is someone called someone we haven't met yet, though, and said that the killer is Tommy Gibbs, and that that got, re that got misunderstood. Mm, I guess it could be, but then it would be better if it gave us some hint about who the caller was. I suppose the alternative is that Tommy Gibbs called and said, Hi, it's Tommy Gibbs. I saw something. And is just trying to cover up for himself, throw throw uh throw suspicion on someone else. DJ uh points out the caller the killer was thought to be wearing a mask so how would they recognize them as Tommy Gibbs hmm. 
It's an interesting theory. All right, we'll get on the record who you think the killer is. Is it just the one brother? Is it the two? Did the father do the first murder? Is the person who called in really Tommy? Someone else? John says, could Tommy have stabbed the first victim and then started to run away? Call police said Tommy Gibbs stabbed me off my bike. It's possible. So we have no real motive, though, for the killer, other than just being a serial killer. Maybe he was born under a blue moon. All right, let's read our solution here. The chat is on record as much as they're going to be on the record. And Tina voted, Jonathan voted. Okay, and Tina says, I say no to the brother for the first murder, torn if it's only the dentist or was the father. Jonathan says, my vote is the dentist brother is the sole killer. First victim made the original phone call, police bungled. Tommy is paying brother to hide nitrous oxide on the farm. Okay, interesting theories. Let's see what we've got. You have successfully completed the Blue Moon Boogeyman. You're standing beside a police cruiser, talking with Mary Louise and Phil when Tommy Gibbs regains consciousness in the back seat. The windows crack slightly, so he has no trouble speaking to you. You're looking for the Blue Moon Boogeyman, he says. That's not me. Well, not entirely. I'm only half. My brother, Stephen Chesterfield, is the other half and the mastermind behind this whole thing. I tried to tell cops about what we did after that first kill. I freaked out and called to tell them what Stefan and I had done. But the officer thought I said my name was... Tammy Gibbs, which threw the investigation off from the start. Things like that have always happened to me. I've always slipped through the cracks, so to speak, even as a young child. My parents gave me up for adoption as a baby because life was tough and they couldn't afford to support a farm, my older brother and me. Nobody even knew I existed. Well, nobody except my parents who weren't proud of giving me up and my brother who didn't learn about me until much later in life. When I was old enough, I petitioned the courts to unseal the records about my birth parents, and that's how I found out about Stephen. I located him easily enough, hoping he was a kindred soul, but we were nothing alike. He was a monster and made me into one. I enrolled at Valley Falls University and moved in the same circles he did, hoping to establish some sort of bond with the brother who didn't know I existed. Um, we became friends, and because of our shared love for Earthstash, and eventually I told him what I had discovered about our shared heritage. To say he was shocked was an understatement. I was just glad to finally have some blood kin. After graduating, I moved away for dental school, but Stephen and I still kept in touch. Upon completing my degree, I returned to Valley Falls and opened my clinic. Living in the same town allowed Stephen and I to learn a lot more about each other. It also gave me a chance to see his dark side. Working on a farm his entire life, Stephen knew what it was like to harvest crops, but he wanted to harvest something more. Stephen came up with the plan to use Earthstash locations as target locations. I didn't want to go along with any of it at first, which prompted him to threaten me to sever all ties with me. 
I didn't want to be without a brother again, so I decided to help him. I even came up with the idea to use the balloons filled with nitrous oxide as bait. When someone is deep in addiction, they will go to any length to get a fix. I would fill the balloons and then distribute them to a few locations around town under the cover of night. By the end of the next day, the balloons were gone and the plan was underway. This was a challenging thing to maintain because blue moons really only occur every two to three years, so I had to continue distributing balloons even in the off years. Eventually, the junkies all came to recognize the appearance of a yellow balloon meant there was more at stake. The yellow balloon didn't contain the clue to the target location. Rather, it was simply an alert that one of the other balloons contained the target location. Stephen would hide in his outfit at the target location to harvest. And eventually, one of the junkies would show up. We would toss the body in the back of his truck and take it to the basement of my dental practice until we disposed of it further. Why did Stephen take the vocal cords, Mary Louise asked. I need to understand. Tommy nodded. Well... According to Stephen, he would hunt wild hogs with our father to keep them from destroying the crops. He never pulled the trigger once. That was our father's job. However, the way the hogs screamed before dying was electrifying for him. Taking the vocal cords was a way of channeling that same experience. As I mentioned before, Stephen has a darkness in him that makes he and I different in a lot of ways. This last kill was different from the others. This last kill was different from the others, Tommy explained. This was actually the first time a victim was with someone else at the time of the attack. Daniel's girlfriend saw Stephen and tried to scream, but no scream came from her mouth. Then Daniel saw Stephen dressed in costume and started screaming. Stephen's blade came down, striking Daniel in the chest, and down he went. Then the girl fainted. The thrill for Stephen came from hearing that fear in a scream, and as a result, he was forced to take the mail this time. Both bodies went into the back of his truck. We dumped the girl out on the side of the road where she was found wandering later. That explains why this last kill didn't match the others, I noted, understanding immediately. He killed Daniel because the girl was mute and couldn't scream. At this point, we'd heard all we needed to hear. Phil put out an alert for Stephen Chesterfield. Within minutes, a report comes in that he's been apprehended after a high-speed vehicle chase near his home. Behind the bench seat of his 1992 Ford F-150, officers found a pair of brown overalls, gray mask, black wig, and rusted sling blade. I'd love to say that serial killers come to Valley Falls once in a blue moon, but and that it's very unlikely we'll see another in these parts for many years to come, but I know that isn't true. They come here all the time to prey on the unsuspecting and the innocent. However, I can say one thing with certainty. The blue moon boogeyman roams no more. Case closed. All right. So there's our solution. It was the brothers working together. The father was not involved in any way. I thought they each had their own box. That was wrong. But I was right that the brothers were both doing it. And our explanation for the phone call by witness was that he really did call in the first statement was trying to get his brother arrested that, or confessed. That seems very weird. Like, if you're going to confess, why not call in and say, Hi, I'm Tommy Gibbs. My brother just killed someone. Like, why give this cryptic half witness statement? Very weird. And then this little story about the mute girl. I suppose it's a little bit, it should have it should have uh, thrown up a little bit of a flag to us that the 
mute girl and the vocal cords might be somehow connected. I think we needed a little more detail about why she wasn't killed. Like it would have been a little more interesting if she was obviously targeted but not killed. Let's take a five minute break. We'll come back and we'll discuss the case. I want to hear what you thought about the ending, about the journey, about the case as a whole, where it fits in. Good parts, bad parts. I think we'll have some interesting things to talk about with this case. So we'll take a five minute break. We'll come back and discuss it.
Okay, we're back to give our final thoughts on Blue Moon Boogeyman. Um, let's look in with the chat and see what we've got here. John says, the case had a very strong start, really enjoyed the setup of the notebook with the story of the previous cases, enjoyed the initial setup of the gathering at the farm. There was the clever coup about the van with the stars on it that DJ picked up on. As it went on, the experience began to drag for me. I think Nicola was right early on when he said most of the puzzles were more of the busy work. Then the cipher puzzle, which was a big spike in difficulty. And Tina says, nice introduction, creepy theme, mixed difficulty for the puzzles, except for the cipher one that needed more hints, needed a bit of a suggestion. John says, I also think the story by the end is too convoluted with not enough clues throughout. Family giving up the second child for adoption, but on top of that, the father has an affair. I'm not sure the father actually had an affair. I think we were told that the father gave up their second son. I'm not sure it said they had an affair, but then I don't understand what the how that other woman connects. John says, at first I thought it ranked near the top. Now I think it'll be more in the middle, but upper middle. Okay. Um, let me see if I can give some thoughts here. I mean, I think Jonathan captures some of the feeling well. I would say... The first couple hours of this case might have been some of the best Deadbolt Mystery Society we've seen, which is pretty amazing given that they've been doing this for six or seven years. Uh, the last two cases that we've played, Admit One and uh, Pale Horse Lake, didn't thrill me. I felt those were pretty thin. This one was felt like much more of a return to form here. And I really like this case. I really did like this case. And right from the start, it had the things that are enjoyable at Deadbolt Mystery Society, like a real strong narrative. We got this big, long introduction, an introductory brief that motivated it. And then the first thing we got, the first piece of evidence is this incredible little diary of the cold cases of our detectives thoughts on these cold cases and this really was a cold case meets current case murder this is one of the best formulas to make these cases compelling where you've got an ongoing killer that's got cold cases that were never solved and then current threats and um boy was that notebook really set the tone and made this an enjoyable case full of little clues and hints and um there was lots there's also felt like maybe the puzzles generally weren't as deep there weren't as many puzzles open to us at any one time it felt a little more linear a little the puzzles were a little more straightforward for the most part but it was very much uh, multiple steps, right? We had to go, there were lots of little pieces where we went to the internet, got some extra information, went to the next step, lots of little envelopes, like two big envelopes, but within each envelope were pieces that you had to solve to unlock. And I do think it created a very interesting narrative and story. And then that whole uh place we went we got the poster for was very cool and then we learned about two new victims it was very interesting you could absolutely see how this could this one case could have get gotten blown up into being like a hunt to kill or six box season <laughs> the fact that it's all in one box is pretty remarkable I think we saw a little bit of the problems with trying to do this all in one box like it felt like the first half was so engaging, and then it's petered out a little at the end. And I think that's a consequence of having to do this all in one box. I do wish Deadbolt Mystery Society would continue, sorry, would consider 
splitting cases into multiple boxes sometimes, like a part one and part two. I really think that would give them some room to make these things wrap up a little more satisfactorily. Um, I really did like this case. First of all, I like the, the, the deadbolt system of having these creepy, adult, scary serial killers and these threats of supernatural, but it's almost always not supernatural. I really like that. That really worked for me. It was scary. It was creepy. And there were scenes in the beginning and the end that were scary. Like we were in a dark place in the basement with the killer. Like it felt a little scary. And when we're opening up these boxes, locked boxes, that was a little creepy and scary. And that was fun. And, um, Again, in the first half, there were several, maybe two or three places where the puzzle wasn't an abstract logic puzzle like most of these are. Like some of the puzzles are like these, <laughs> this puzzle where we're just creating this, assembling these things to make a maze to connect them and then putting it. Those are just busy work, little logic, abstract puzzles. They're fine. They're amusing, but they're not deeply satisfying. But this game had a couple that were good. And one of them, DJ, who's in the channel here, figured out was a puzzle that had to do with one of the witnesses saying they saw stars and another witness saying they saw Druid and like connecting that with the logos. And this idea that normally you would expect a little bit of a logic puzzle, and even the game sort of throws you off. It says, I wonder if the business names are important. And the truth is that the solution of this was much more of a classic cold case document dump game and not a puzzle game, which was figuring out that it probably they're talking about this one with the stars. That was really satisfying. And then there were, there were a couple more of those. There was the one with the... Um, there was the one about this part, we're figuring out, okay, we had to figure out this. This was sort of a traditional logic puzzle. But then we had to make the leap to think that, okay, we should be looking for the interview with someone who used that word. And that kind of thing was really quite good. Now, there are a couple places where it was a little silly, like talking to the merchant who is selling shirts and giving him a key phrase. I mean, it wasn't all, all the puzzles weren't fantastic, but there were some good ones that had to do more with deduction and reading than with uh, abstract puzzles. And I really do enjoy that. The cipher, uh, I agree with what everyone is saying here in terms of that needed a little more that needed to say more than, hey, it's a cipher with a, that you need this keyword for. There needed to be something more there that explained how you should use that. I think if you expect people to be able to solve it without a hint, it needed a little bit more. But one thing that was cool about that is that there were a bunch of puzzles here that we got lots of foreshadowing for. Like we saw the puzzle and then it took us hours before we got to the point where we could solve it. And you know, like this notebook told us how to decode the geocache stuff. And we didn't get to use this. We saw this in the beginning and it took us four hours before we got to use that. And that was fun to anticipate that. Um, let's check in a little bit with the chat. Do we know what happened to their mom? I wish games would not only tell you the solution, but explain how you were supposed to figure it out. Well, don't forget. Deadbolt has a full detailed hint system with all of their games. And it's quite possible that if we look at Pale Blue, Pale, the Blue Moon Boogeyman, that we might find in the hints. So here, look at, I mean, this is some nice work putting hints, these detailed hints for all of these. These are hints, and then the next page, next file is 
solutions. Let's see. Not much help here. I mean, we did solve all of the puzzles fairly quickly, and some of them gave us some a little bit of struggle. Not too bad for this group, but a little bit. Let's see what the solutions look like. These are just the solutions. Um, now, as far as the end of the story with the brothers and stuff, I mean, I think it's reasonable for as far as these puzzle go, puzzle games go. I mean, you can see one of the reasons I like the deadbolt system is that this is a fairly generous narrative epilogue story right and told fairly well compared to lots of other puzzle games that might give you just a little bit this gives us a long thing now i don't quite it does feel like sometimes you play these games and it feels like mm, they had a bigger story planned and they have to condense it and the thing about that other woman having the date was weird to me and the game's explanation for that was weird it's like the game explanation was like hey you put in the date because it's the only date you got and it works and you wonder why the game was like you wonder why your dad's death the dad's death was on that box but that date worked like that seems weird to me and i still don't understand what that woman has to do with this date i just don't get that still but maybe that's gonna be told in a secret part two you might think i don't know anything but you're never spent much time at my bridge club she says i hear lots of stuff and then when we talk to her where is her thing that she says I like to read her I don't, sometimes this PDF thing is not the best. Uh, uh, are you even seeing this? No, you're not even seeing what I'm going through. All right, well, I'd like to bring up her. I like to bring up her page. But I'm not going to be able to find it. I wish they did a little bit better job naming these files so that they didn't leak information and so that we could, it was the game. I don't see it here. All right, I give up. But her stuff about not wanting to tell us about what that date meant, I still don't understand what that was about. There were some, uh, Jonathan points out the video was cool, did seem to give some issues for mobile device. Yeah, I'm not, I, I wouldn't call it gives an issue, but it was having to pause it. I don't know if I can complain about that, but I did like how it threw us off the trail. Like, first we thought we had figured it out, right? Like, we had found the magic shop. It seemed like that guy was the killer. He looked suspicious. He was seen at the crime. But that was just a red herring, and we eventually eliminated him. 
And in fact, there were some cool parts. This gets back to the thing about it being more of a traditional cold case document dump game. Some of the people we eliminated were eliminated based on some subtle stuff, right? Like, I think we would have missed, there were two clues in that video. One was the discount code, but the other one that uh, Antina, I think, spotted was the idea that it actually had a al timeline alibi for him. So that was pretty good. Where was our, I guess we're never going to be able to find that one. Um, maybe it would be nice to, I just want to see it because I think it was 149 to 150 because it's sort of important what she says because she has the date, right? It's TMB2 Boogeyman Unlocked. I have to put this in again, and I'm not showing it to you, and I don't know if I can remember. 149, 150, was that what it was? 149, 150. What's happening here? Okay, here she is. She says, some of what I hear, she's just telling us stuff I hear. Okay, one of the two original suspects is no longer alive. October 23rd, 2012 holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to myself. So is she just saying, like, are we supposed to believe that when she says one of the two original suspects in the case is no longer alive, October 23rd, 2012 holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to my spell. Are we supposed to read that as her saying, hey, one of the original suspects died and the date that he died was October 23rd, 2012, period which also happens to be a special place in my heart that's unrelated to this case. That's confusing and it's very weird. I, I, it feels like that could have been expressed much more clearly since it's not relevant to the mystery. It feels like she just should have said one of the original suspects died on October 23rd, 2012 which holds a special place in my heart for reasons I'll keep to myself. Or are we supposed to think that she, for some reason, is involved with the father? Do we remember where it says about the son being put up for adoption? Yes, we do. It was on this sheet here. Dennis Chesterfield is dead. I found his final resting place when I was snooping around. The epitaph read, loving husband, father of two. He was having an affair, and rumor has it he gave up his second child by his wife for adoption at birth. Okay, so he was having an affair, and probably what with this woman. Okay, that's why she's happy. Rumor has it he gave up his second child by his wife for adoption. I see. Okay, so maybe it does make sense. Maybe he was having an affair with this woman. His The baby, the second baby, was still with his wife, but maybe things were so bad with the wife because he was cheating on her that the wife was like, no, I'm not having the second kid in the house. I hate you. I hate everyone. Okay, maybe it does. Maybe it did make a little bit more sense now that we think about it a little more. Okay, so that's where I got thrown off. We did think she was having an affair, but then we were thinking she was the mother of the child, but it's not. The child was by the wife, but it makes a little bit of sense. I think another way to look at it is this is a lot of, a lot of story and game packed into one box. And, uh, 
the fact that we had so much fun enjoyment going on this roller coaster it was creepy it was scary and then at the very end we had debates and discussions the I don't think you can ask for too much more in one box. Maybe a little bit better on the ending, a little bit more clues wrapping up the end of the story, but for a for a single box, pretty darn good. All right, we should end it here. We've been on the air for six hours. I had a blast on Sunday. We'll be playing Mugbook um, at the end of the month, some game design streams, and then we'll start talking about October playing some special deluxe creepy games. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, had a blast as always. Great teamwork. Couldn't have done it without you. I'll see you all on the next live stream.